Hey guys, and welcome back to a new tutorial series. So essentially, this is online game development with Python, which means we're going to be using sockets and networking to connect what's known as a client and a server or multiple clients to a server where they can send and share information. And therefore, we can create an online game. So we're going to start off with just the absolute basics and just get shapes. For example, like if I move a shape on my computer, um, it moves a shape on your computer, like if you're the other client. And then we'll start getting into some more advanced stuff where we create a legitimate game and start sending mass amounts of information to the server and back to the client. So we'll start uh, really simply by just getting everything working on our local network. And then once it's working on our local network, we'll deploy that to an external server, which will allow us to play from anywhere in the world, not just against people on our local network. Okay, so what I'm showing you right now is actually an online game that I created with Python, Pygame, and networking. And this is similar to something we're gonna make, obviously not as advanced, uh, but it works on the same principles. So essentially, I have what is known as two clients. Now, if you don't know, the way that any online game works is we have multiple clients connecting to one main location, which is known as a server. Now, right here on my screen, we have two clients. So this client on the left that my mouse is kind of going over that has this red uh, highlight, like where the rook is or where I just am about to move this knight, is client one. And then this black one over here, so like you are black, uh, where I just moved this pawn is client two. Now you can see in the background, I have this command line thing going and it's sending and receiving information. And this is essentially how a online game works. And you might see uh, whenever you guys play an online game, it says waiting for server or connecting to server. And that's because it's doing exactly that. It's waiting to get a connection to the server and then grab information from that. So that's the way that we're gonna be doing things is using a client and server. Now I'm not gonna be using any frameworks that are pre-created like, uh, I know there's like Twisted and some other frameworks for Python. The only module we're gonna be using that's external is Pygame, and that's just to create some very basic graphics. Uh, okay, so let's close this. I just wanna give you guys an example of what an online game looks like. And you can see when I was moving something on one client, it would move it on the other. So let's close that up. Uh, and let's actually get started with the tutorial. Oh, did not mean to open that. So I'm gonna be working with PyCharm uh, for this tutorial. Now, if you don't know what PyCharm is, it's an IDE. Uh, to download it, all you have to do is just go to the internet, type PyCharm, and you can go here and click download whenever it loads up. Now, if you guys don't want to use PyCharm, that's absolutely fine. You can do everything using the standard editor like IDLE. You could use Atom. You can use whatever you want. Um, but if you want to follow exactly with the tutorial, I'm going to be using PyCharm. Now, the next thing we're going to need... Um, other than IDE, I guess you don't need PyCharm, is we're gonna have to install Pygame. Now for 90% of you, the way that you're gonna be able to install Pygame is just by going to command prompt, uh, loading it up like this, and just typing pip install Pygame, and then hitting enter. Now, uh, if this doesn't work for you, I'll put a card in the top right hand corner of the screen right now, which tells you where you can go to install Pygame. Uh, and I have a video explaining you exactly how to do this. And if this command doesn't work for you, you can follow that video and I'll explain to you how to do that. So once we have Pygame, then we're ready to actually start writing a bit of code. So while I launch up PyCharm right here and create a new project, uh, let me just tell you about I don't know, some of the things we'll be going through in this tutorial series. So obviously we're gonna be working on coding both a client and a server, and I'm gonna explain obviously exactly how those things work uh, and how we can create them. And then what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be dealing with a bit of uh, server like administration, if you wanna say that. So actually deploying things to an external server, um, installing, installing dependencies, uh, working with like a Linux server, to deploy our game to and that'll be at the end of the series that we do that right now we're just going to be working with what's known as local host which means that we're just going to be doing it on our own network so right now the games that we create are only going to work on our uh what do you call it against people that are on our wi-fi or on the same network as us and then later it'll work against anyone in the world that has uh, that client downloaded okay so let's just create a new project here my new project i'm just going to say is tutorial uh, let's say network tutorial one or something uh, and just as a, what do you call it here? Just letting you guys know, I did actually mess up my thumb a little bit. It's kind of swollen. So if my typing is not the best, that is actually my excuse for that. So now that I've got a new project open, I'm just gonna create a new Python file. Let's just call this tutorial one. Actually, let's call this client, okay? And just save that as okay, because that's all we're gonna be coding in this video. It's just a very basic client. 
Uh, okay, so now we've got client. So what I'm going to start off by doing is creating a configuration for my client. And keep in mind, if you guys are using something else, you don't have to worry about what I'm doing with this PyCharm specifics. This is just the way you have to set up a project in uh, PyCharm. So I'm just going to set a client. I'm going to go to script path, network game, client, OK. Apply, OK. Now, quick side note, all the code that I'm about to write is available on my website, techwithtim.net. Usually I have as well as that a text-based tutorial version. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to write the text-based tutorial while um, this first tutorial is out, but you will see it on there at some point, import tutorial, import Pygame. Uh, but yeah, all the code will be available on there in case you guys miss something or something's not working. So we're just going to start by importing Pygame and make sure that that's working. Once that's working, we're going to create a window. So to do that, we'll just say win equals Pygame. Uh, dot display dot update or what am I saying pi game dot display dot set underscore cap set underscore mode wow a bit tired today guys and then in here we're just gonna type width and height and then we're gonna create these variables so we'll say width equals 500 height equals 500 okay so there we go with height win and now we're just going to set up a few global variables that we're going to have to use after we create a caption so let's just say pi game dot display dot set underscore caption and then here we'll just give it a caption let's just say clients okay all right so now let's set up a global variable that we're going to use and what we're going to do for this global variable is it's going to hold um the current like clients so we're going to say like client number and we'll just start by making that zero but we're going to increment that based on like once we connect to the server which we'll do later okay so now that we've done that uh there's a few basic things and this is just what we always do for like a pi game project or whatnot i'm just going to define redraw window okay and in here all we're going to do is just pi game dot display dot update like that and we'll also fill the display before we do that oops didn't mean to do that uh, with win dot fill uh, and then we'll just pick a color in this case I want to do white so we'll just do 255 255 255 okay now yeah I just realized this is actually gonna be a lot harder to type than I thought because of my thumbs so just excuse me guys if I'm making a few mistakes here okay so we got our redraw window now and what we can do next is we can um, code our main loop so I'm gonna say define main and in here i'm just going to create a game loop and this is going to run continuously while our program is going and it's just going to be what's checking for collision checking for events can constantly asking the server for information and you guys will see how this works in later videos more so we're going to say run equals true and in here we'll say while well run and we'll just set up some very basic things that we always do for pi game so for event in pi game dot event dot get okay and then all we're going to do is say if event dot type equals equals pygame dot quit with all capitals then we will simply do pygame dot quit like that uh don't need a semicolon i guess we can say run equals false as well okay uh for events that looks good and then what else we'll do in here is we'll just call that redraw window function so redraw window like that now what i'm thinking we should do next is probably set up a class for our character okay now our character is going to be just the only object we're working with right now and it's just going to represent like a rectangle that moves like left down up right uh, around our screen and i guess we'll do that all in this video moving that character around and then we'll connect it to uh the server in the next one so let's create a class and we'll do that up here and we'll say class player uh, like that okay so we'll give it a, a knit function and if you guys don't know much about object oriented program and programming and you want to learn i do have a tutorial series on my channel um, that i would recommend you go through if you don't understand a lot of the stuff that i'm doing right now okay so x y with height will be what we get in here and this is just going to represent actually let's give it a color as well because that'll be good to have x y with height color and yeah this will just represent kind of our player and what variables they're going to have so we'll pass these values in when we create a new player so self dot y equals y this is very straightforward self dot width equals width and self dot height equals height and finally self dot color equals color so these are just our initialization here uh this is what we're going to use when we're drawing the character when we're checking for a collision or stuff like that um, and what I'm also going to do to just save us a bit of time in the future is I'm going to say self.rect equals and then in here let's do this okay so x y width height like that okay and this will just make it a bit faster when we're trying to draw our character 
So the next thing we're going to need is to find draw. Now in the draw method here, we're going to take a window. So we'll call that win. And all we're going to do is just draw a rectangle that represents our character onto the screen. Uh, and it'll obviously be the appropriate color. So to do that, all we have to do is just say win dot. Oh, no, we don't have to do that. We have to do pi game dot draw dot rect standing for rectangle. We have to first give the window. So we'll give win. We need the color, so we'll do self.color. And then we need a rect, which will be self.rect. Okay, and that's actually all we need to do to draw the rectangle to the screen. Now we need one more method we're gonna use, and this is gonna be called move. And move actually, I believe, yeah, we don't need to do anything else in there right now uh, as a argument, sorry. So for move, what this is gonna do is it's essentially just gonna check um, what do you call it if they press like left key right key whatnot how can we move them around the screen so the way that we can do this really basically essentially is just do pi game dot uh what do you call it dot keys dot get underscore pressed i believe that's it it might be key mm, might be keys we'll see we'll see if, which one works so this is essentially going to give us a list of all of the keys um actually a dictionary of all of the keys and essentially each key is going to have a value of either zero or one now, if one is true, that means we're currently pressing the key. If zero is uh, there, then it means we're not pressing the key. So the way that this is useful, as opposed to doing what we could sometimes do, which is just check for events in here, is if you're pressing more than one key at once, it'll allow you to move like diagonally or whatnot. OK, so what we can do in here now is we can just check if certain keys are pressed and then change the X and Y values accordingly. So we'll say if um, what do you call it? Oh, I guess we should probably put this in a variable list. We'll say keys equals pi game dot maybe i feel like it's key we're gonna go key for right now pi game dot key don't get underscore press so say if keys and then pi game dot k underscore left standing for our left arrow key and that's all we need to do for that one and then we'll say if keys and then pi game dot k underscore is this should this be all capitals i think it should be uh k underscore right and then the next one if keys pi game dot k underscore up and then our last one obviously is down and then we'll change our values accordingly inside of these if statements so pi game dot k underscore down okay so left right up down so if we press the left arrow key obviously what we have to do is subtract from our x value so to do that we'll just say self dot x minus equals self dot vel now Val is something we need to define. So let's do that up here. Self dot val equals and let's do a value of like three for right now. OK, so if we're going right, we need to add to our X. So we'll do this very similar. So self dot X plus plus equals self dot val. OK, if I could type that correctly and then to go up, we're going to subtract from our Y value. So self dot Y minus equals self dot val. And to go down, we'll do self dot y plus equals self dot val. And that's the way the coordinate system works in Pi game. Our coordinates actually at the top left hand of our player or our screen. So if we want to go down, we have to add to it. And then left and right is the same in terms of subtracting and adding. OK, so that should successfully move our player. Uh, we could add like a jump and stuff in here another time. But for right now, that's all we need. I'm trying to think of anything else that we could do right now. Um, we should probably create a player object and draw that to the screen just to make sure everything's working. So to do that, let's create a player. Um, should we do it up here? Let's do it right above our main loop here. OK, so we're just going to say or actually we'll do it inside the main loop. This will work better. We'll say uh, P standing for player just equals player and then we'll give it some values. You need X, Y with height color. So for X, Y, we'll just start him at like 50, 50. And then for our width, let's just do 100 by 100. So he's nice and big and we can see him. And then we'll do a color of green. So that would be red green blue like that so 255 for green and then what we're going to do, do actually is we're going to type in here insert in redraw window we're just going to pass p to our uh redraw window so that we can draw him and before we do that we'll call p dot move and what this will do is move our character based on what keys we're pressing so inside redraw window let's add a player um what do you call it argument attribute whatever you want to call that um sorry parameter that's the correct name and then we'll just say player dot draw like that and we'll pass win in here which probably should be passed in here as well because we do use win quite a bit so let's do p let's do win and then p 
Okay, so let's run this now and see if I made any mistakes. I likely did. Uh, process finished. Oh, we're ne never calling the main function. So let's call this main function from down here. So we're actually executing that code that we wrote. And there we go. So now we have a little green square and you can see, hmm, interesting. It's not working for me to move this around. Uh, so let's check this one more time. P dot move. What is move doing? Get pressed. Let's just add, I want to add something here and make sure this is working. So let's, we're going to say clock equals pi game dot time dot clock. Okay. And then in here, we're just going to do clock dot tick. Uh, and we'll do 60 FPS. I just want to see if this is working. If not, I do know how to fix this. Um, okay, so we're not able to actually move this. Oh, I know why. So, very interesting. We are not updating this rect, but we are updating, um, <laughs> what do you call it, like up, down, left, right. So at the bottom here, all we're going to do is just redefine our rect by doing self.x, self.y, self dot width and self dot height. Now I'll really ex quickly explain why this error was happening. Essentially we're defining rect up here based on the input parameters when we're creating our player. So that means we're always just constantly drawing our rectangle in the same position because we're never updating this rect variable. We're only updating like x, y width height, right? So we just have to redefine our rect variable every single time that we're moving, which is fine and we can do that. So now let's see, and we can move our green square around the screen. I actually quite like the speed of this movement. Um, so yeah, so essentially in the next video, what we're gonna be doing is I'm wrapping it up here, is we'll add a, a little bit more to this client and then we'll start working with sockets so we can connect this up to a server and we'll start talking about all the networking aspecting then. So in this tutorial, we're going to be working on coding the server. And then in the next video, we're going to be connecting this client that we made in the last one uh, to that server and then sending information to and from the server. Uh, so let's get started and let's create a new file that is going to be our server file. So I'll just call this one server.py. And then in here, we're just going to have to import a few things. And I'll talk about exactly what they're going to do for us once we start using them. So let's start by importing sockets. Uh, or socket, uh, then we can import underscore thread. And we'll also import uh, OS. Okay, so actually not OS, sorry, SYS. That's all we need for that. So what we're going to be doing, like I've talked about, is we're going to be using sockets and threading to uh, handle connections to our server. And essentially what that means is we're going to set up a socket and it's going to allow for connections to come into our server on a certain port. So we're going to start by just defining a server, which is going to be a string and port, which is going to be a number. Now for port, um, you guys probably know what ports are. Uh, you might have heard of them before. For example, like a common port you would use on uh, or a common port that is used like on your router would be port 80. And that is for HTTP connections. There's also a port like 443. There's, there's tons of other ports that have, um, distinct uses, but there's also a ton of ports that don't have any uses and that are just left open for programs like this or for different things to be used for. So what port I'm going to use, which is typically open, um, it depends on like what router you're using and your internet connection, but typically a port that's open is 5555. Um, so we're going to use this port to connect to and from, and it's just a safe port to use as opposed to trying to use another number uh, that we might not know if it's being used for something else or not. Okay, so once we've done that, we've created a server and created a port. What we're going to do is we're going to set up what's known as a socket. Okay, and we'll talk about exactly how this works in a second. Um, but we're just going to say s equals socket dot socket. And then here we're going to type something that's probably going to mean nothing to you, but I'll talk about what it means. So we'll say socket equals af uh, uh, underscore inet. Okay, and then socket dot sock stream like that. All right. Now, these are just the types of connection. So since we're going to be connecting to a uh, IPv4 address, which again, we're going to keep talking about all this stuff as we go through in case you guys are unfamiliar with networks, uh, this is the type we're going to have to use. And SockStream just, I believe, represents um, like how this server string comes in. I could be wrong on that, but um, this is the type we're going to use. And for any kind of applications like this, this will be what you use for your socket okay so we're just initializing that and now the next thing to do is to bind our server and our port to the socket so to do this we need to do a try and accept and the reason we do this is because like i talked about we don't know if this is actually going to work initially doing it 
there could be in some instance this port is already being used for something and if that's happening that means that this is going to fail so we need to try and accept this so it will accept uh what do you call it uh error as e so what do we say socket dot error as e and we'll just print that out to the screen just so we know why we're not working there uh otherwise what we'll do is we'll say s dot bind and then in here we're going to put server comma port okay so we'll bind to whatever ip address we'll put in here uh to this given port okay so i hope everything's making sense so far essentially what we're doing when we do sockets is we're setting up um a connection or we're using a port on our server on our network um, it's going to look for certain connections and then we'll be doing this on the client side as well we'll be binding or not i don't know if we'll be binding we'll just be connecting to a certain server and a port um, and then since we're connecting to that this server script that we're going to have running will see that connection and handle it in some way okay so now that we've done that i'm trying to think what else we have to do Okay, so what we're going to start by doing is we're going to start listening for connections. Um, so we're going to do s.listen. Now, s.listen essentially just opens up the port. So now we can start connecting to it and having multiple clients connecting and whatnot. Um, so in here, this actually takes one argument. Now, it's optional. Uh, and if you leave it blank, it means it'll allow for unlimited connections to happen. Now, depending on what kind of program you're writing uh, is what you're going to do for this. Now, for me, I only want two people to be able to connect to my, uh, what do you call it? Yeah, to my server. So we're just going to do s.listen2. Now, this might actually be one because it might be like zero, one, but I think two may be the correct thing. So we'll do s.listen for now. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we're going to print after we listen. Uh, we'll just say waiting for a connection and we'll say server started or something like that because once we get to this point we are running the server and everything actually is working like we're listening for connection we're ready to go okay so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to define something known as a threaded function okay and we'll i'll talk about again what this means um but let's just do threaded uh threaded underscore client for now and i'm just putting you don't actually have to name it this you can name it whatever you want i'm just putting threaded here just so we know this is threaded and then it's going to take one argument which is going to be conn which stands for connection and let's just pass in there for right now so the way that threading works uh actually let's let's do the threading and then i'll talk about how it works because it'll probably make a bit more sense so let's do a while true down here okay so once we set up uh, our server, our port, we bind it, doing here, we're starting to listen, waiting for a connection, starting the server. Then what we're going to do is we'll be get put into this while loop. And what this while loop will do is we'll continuously look for connections, okay? Because right here, we're just listening uh, like once, right? To see if anything's on that server or port. But down here, we want to continually try to grab connection to see if something connected. And if it does, then we want to print something to the screen or we want to send information or we want to start a new thread, which we'll talk about in a second. So in here, what we're going to do is we're going to say connection, uh, which is C-O-N-N, and then A-D-R equals, and then S dot, and then we'll say accept. And what S dot accept is going to do is it's going to, well, accept any incoming connections. Uh, and then it's going to store the connection and the address. And the connection is, by the way, an object representing like what's connected. The address is going to be an IP address in these uh, variables, okay? So if we get a connection, uh, what we'll do is we'll say print uh, connected to, okay, and then ATR. And this is just gonna show us what IP address is actually connecting, uh, so we can have a look at that. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna do start underscore new underscore thread. And then in here, we're going to do, uh, what was that name of the function that we had? Was threaded client, okay. And I believe we do comma and then in brackets here we do C O N like that. Okay, so start new thread. Is there a reason that's not working? Um, give me a sec, guys. I want to see why. Oh, that's why. So up here, instead of saying import thread, we're going to say from underscore thread import star. Okay, and that's just going to make it so we can just do this start new thread thing. And you know what? I don't know if we're going to need this S Y S, but let's just leave it there for now. Okay, so let's talk about what threading is going to do. So essentially, the way that you guys are used to programs working, I'm assuming unless you have some familiarity with threading, is that uh, say we're in this while loop, right? And we were to call the function threaded client. Well, 
before we continue going with this while loop, we would have to wait until this function was done running. In other words, we return back from this function some value, or uh, for example, like he does like x equals five, we would have to wait for this x equals five to execute, and then it would come back in this while loop and keep going. Now, we don't want that to happen because we're gonna be having multiple connections going at once. So what we wanna do is we wanna, and start what's called a thread. And a thread is just another process that's running in the background. So that just means when we do start new thread and we do threaded client, um, it's gonna run this function, but it's not gonna need this function to finish executing before it continues the while loop. So this is gonna be running in the background as like process two, while process one is still running and still going. So that means say we connect to a hundred different things. We're going to have a hundred different functions running. So a hundred different threaded clients um, on the stack or like keep going. And then what we're going to have is this while loop still continuing to go. What did I just do? Um, still continuing to run to look for another possible connection. You guys will see more how this works, but essentially just means this will run in the background and we don't have to wait for it to finish executing before we can accept another connection. That, that's the basic kind of way to, that works. So now let's start working with threaded client and then we will uh, test the server out and see if it's working. And then obviously in the next video, we're going to connect to it and do all the connection stuff. Okay. So in here, uh, threaded client. So what should happen when we connect to uh, a client? Well, we're going to have to do a while loop in here. So we're going to say while true because we want this to continually run while our client is still connected. Okay. Now, what we're also going to do is we're just going to say reply equals blank like that. And I'm just copying from my other screen because this one is a bit finicky. I don't want to mess it up. We're going to put a try in here. And what we're going to say is we're going to try to receive some kind of data from our um, connection. Okay. From whoever's connected, we want to receive some kind of data. So what we'll do is we'll say, I believe it's uh, scon.receive. That might be right. Yeah, I think that's right. And then in here, we're going to put the amount of bits. Okay. Now, if you guys know anything about computing, you know like how, what bits represents, um, but essentially this is the amount of information we're trying to receive. Now, if you're getting an error, when say you'd like do this and you connect up and you get some error that says, um, what do you call it? Like object was true on, or like uh, you, you're getting any errors, just increase this size, okay? And you can just do that by like putting this like times eight or something. Just note that the larger this size is, the longer it's going to take to receive information. And that's obviously because the more information you're getting, the longer it takes to send that over the server. So 2048 bits is not a lot. It doesn't take very long. It happens almost instantly. But if you bump this number up to a ton, then it will take uh, longer to do that. Okay. So data, uh, and we're going to say reply equals, and then we're going to say data dot, I think it's actually string dot decode. Hmm, let's see this. Oh, data dot decode because it'll be in that, that kind of object for that data dot decode. And then here we're going to do UTF comma eight. Now, the reason we have to do this is because whenever we're sending information over a like client server system, we have to encode the information. And you'll see that in the next step that we're going to encode information before we send it back to the client. Um, but that means that we're receiving encoded information. So to actually be able to read it like as a human readable string, we need to decode it first. Uh, so it's really easy to do that. We just do dot decode and we're just giving the format, which is UTF eight. Okay. So reply equals that. And then what we're going to say is we're going to say, if not data, we're going to print uh, disconnected. Okay. And then we're going to break. And this just means if we try to get some information from the, uh, what do you call it? The client, but we're not getting anything. We're going to disconnect and we're going to break. And that likely means that we've well disconnected from the client or the client's left or something like that. So instead of continuing to run this while loop and trying to get information from a client that's disconnected, we're going to break. This is just kind of a fail safe to make sure we don't get into any infinite loops. And it's also going to show us if we're running into any issues with like receiving the data and decoding it, which we'll talk about later. Okay. So otherwise, so if we are getting information, all we're going to do is we're going to print uh, received. Is that how you spell received? Maybe. Uh, and then we're going to put, what do you call it? Reply. Okay. I uh, didn't mean to do that. Let me see if I'm spelling this right. I am not. Okay. Received reply. So this just means we received from the client, uh, this reply, let's print it to the screen and see what it looks like. And then we're going to print sending, uh, colon 
and we'll just print reply okay and then we'll talk about this again in a second why does this keep happening okay reply next now after this uh, if not data breakout what we'll do down here is we're going to say con dot send all and we're going to send str dot encode reply now again remember that since we're sending information over the server we have to encode our information so all this is going to do is just encode our string reply into a bytes object so that means when we read it in from the client side again we'll have to decode that information uh, it's kind of annoying but i mean it's a bit security thing right so now we're just going to accept uh i guess what what kind of error would it even be i don't even know if there's gonna be any errors if we run into anything let's just break uh just to make sure that we're not you know getting in that infinite loop or we're not gonna r ruin the program by doing that okay so this is actually about it for our server uh let's see how much time we're at 13 minutes okay so now what we need to do is figure out what this server number is and then we can actually test it and see if this is working uh so what we're going to do now is we're gonna find the server number. Now to do this, we're gonna be doing this over uh, localhost, okay? That means that our, we're only gonna be able to connect over our local network, meaning that like anything on our Wi-Fi network um, that can see each other, that'll work fine. But as soon as we go outside that network, it won't work. So we're gonna be using what's known as local IP addresses. So to find the local IP address of the machine you're currently on, you're gonna to go to command prompt in the bottom left. Uh, and then you're just going to type IP config. Okay. Now, um, some of you guys are probably freaking out because you can see my IP address right now. This is a local IP address. And that means that it is locally assigned to my network. No one outside of my network can see this IP address or can ping it or can DDoS it or anything like that. Okay. So it's perfectly fine if you guys see this address or if other people know what this local address is. Okay. Just as a note. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this IPv4 address, so we'll just copy that, and we're going to paste that inside of the string here, okay? So 10.11.250.207 is mine. Now yours likely is like 192.168. something, okay? But since I'm on like a massive network, usually they use 10.10 .10 like as the default gateway, which is what they're using. So my IP address starts with a 10. Yours likely starts with 192.168.1 or dot like five or something like that and then the rest of it okay so that's the address we're going to use and this is going to be our server address so whatever machine that you're going to be running the server script on that's the address you want so say you want to run this server on your laptop uh, and you want to run clients on like your pc and your mac or something like that then you want to make sure you get the ip address from your laptop and you're putting it in that script okay and we'll talk about more of this in the next video when we actually connect to it Okay, so now that we've done this, um, I probably made a mistake, but let's actually just create a configuration quickly for server uh, and run this and just see if we're getting any errors as of now. Now, it is worth noting that we're not going to be able to connect anything yet. Um, so there's not really going to be much we can see or really do. Uh, but for now, let's just test this out. So let's have server, let's run this. And you can see waiting for a connection and server started. So that's actually good. If you're getting this uh, string of text, everything is currently working. Uh, in the next video, we'll probably have to debug a little bit once we start connecting to this. But for now, that is the main server script. Now, I'll briefly just talk about before I end this video, how it's going to work in terms of running the server script and running the client script. Um, the server script always has to be running. Okay. So whenever you're trying to connect, you have to have first run the server script, and then you can run multiple client scripts from wherever on the network you want. Now the server script has to be running on the machine that the IP address is like this little string here. Okay. It has to be running on that machine. Um, and you can run a client script on the same machine that the server script's running. And you can run multiple client scripts on the same machine. So like, for example, what I'm going to do to test this in the next video is I'm going to run the server and then I'm going to run two clients on uh, this machine and we'll see that it like is moving back and forth for them. So what we're going to be doing in this video is we're going to be coding the uh, kind of client side of this. So connecting to the server. Uh, I know we already coded a client, but we're going to code like the network aspect of the client so that it can connect to the server. Uh, it's not as much code. It's a bit more straightforward. And then we're just going to test out sending very basic information to the server and hopefully getting some back. See if that's working OK. And then in the next video, we're going to be connecting this. So like the little user interface we created with moving that block around in the first video, we're going to be connecting that um, so that we can have multiple clients running and we can see like different blocks moving on each screen. OK, so that will involve a bit more work. Um, hopefully by video five, we'll have like a fully working kind of 
game that's working over the network okay that's the goal so within this video i just want to start by saying on this server class here or sorry server file i did actually forget two lines of code in the last video so after this accept break in threaded client just need to add this print lost connection and then connection dot close all this is doing is once we break out of this threaded client we're just letting the uh we're just going to print this to the console so we can see what it looks like and then we're going to close that connection um so that we can possibly reopen it in the future okay really straightforward that's all you got to add so just make sure you add that before moving on okay so next what we're going to do is we're going to create a new file um and i'm going to call this network okay now you don't have to put what i'm going to in a new file it's just a lot easier so that's why i'm going to do that so let's do network and in here we're going to import socket now what i'm going to do is i'm just going to code a class that is going to be responsible for connecting to our server and this just makes it like so i can reuse this class in the future and you guys could reuse this class in the future um, and it's just a bit cleaner and nicer and that's the way i like to do things so we're going to say class network again call this whatever you want and in here we're just going to set an initialization function uh, we'll take actually as network. Do we need anything in network? Uh, no, I think we'll just leave it like that. So we're going to say self.client equals socket dot socket. It's going to be the exact same arguments as last time. So we'll say socket dot uh, if net. I think that is that what it is? If underscore net. Uh, AF underscore I net. Okay. And then we'll do socket dot sock stream like that. Okay, now we're gonna define the server and the port again. So self.server equals uh, self.port equals 5555. Now for the server, this again, this number has to be the same as the one you used in the server, uh, what do you call it? The server file here. So no matter what, like no matter where you actually are, um, like what client you're using, this number is gonna stay the same because this is the server you're connecting to. It's not the client's address. Uh, we don't actually have to define the client's address anywhere. It'll automatically get that for us. Okay, so what we're gonna do now, uh, we have client server port. We need to do this, self.addr equals, and then we're gonna say server, so self.server and then self.port in here okay and then self dot what do you call it self dot id is going to be equal to self dot connect okay uh now you guys actually let's just do self dot connect for right now and we'll talk about why i was going to add this id later once we add that functionality to the server okay essentially i wanted to have an id uh, that was returned here or like that was stored in this network object just because we are gonna have to like be sending an ID to each of our clients so they know if they're like player one or player two. But we'll do that later because um, we don't really, we can't really do that yet. Okay, so we've called this connect method. So we need to write that now. So let's say define connect. Okay, and in here, I believe we should probably be given, actually, like, it's probably fine to just do self right now. And what we can do is we can do self.client.connect. Okay, and then in here we can do self.addr. Now we're going to throw this in a try uh, and accept just in case, you know, this isn't working. So we'll say try, we'll say accept, uh, and is, are we going to do socket error? Um, let's say accept, and we'll just pass right there, okay? Uh, just in case this doesn't work. So we'll try this, we'll try to connect, uh, accept, pass. Now, once we actually connect, what we're going to do is we're going to return, um, I'm just looking at my other screen right now, self.client.receive. And then we'll do 2048.decode. Okay, so what this is going to do, uh, I'll talk about this because it might be a little bit confusing, is when we connect, uh, we want to actually send some kind of information immediately back to the object that connected to us. So, like, for example, let's go in this. Oh, I didn't mean to close that. Uh, let's go into server here. And you can see when we initially connect, we're not sending any information until we receive something. Now that's fine, but when we connect, we should really send some kind of like validation token or like ID back to our network object or back to our client. So what I'm gonna do in here, I'm gonna say con.send, okay? And then in here, what we're gonna type is, let's see, what should we really type here? Um, str.encode, and then here we'll just say connected like that, okay? Uh, just so we know that we did indeed connect. So that means if we set this equal to a value, so self dot, uh, I don't know, let's say ID equals self dot connect. What will happen is when we connect, uh, we'll return that string connected. 
So this will get connected. And since it's encoded, we need to decode it, obviously. So if we want to print actually in here, self.id, it should say like connected. Okay. Let's, let's see if that works. Okay. So now that we actually have that, um, let's see if we can connect to the server and then we'll deal with sending information from the client to the server as opposed to just getting it from the server. Okay. I know it's a bit confusing right now. I'm just trying to figure out the best way to do this. Um, so let's try this. Okay. So we're going to say N equals network. And we'll just type this at the bottom of the script. Uh, we won't do this after we'll delete this just for testing purposes. And then we're just going to say, uh, actually, that's probably all we need to do because it'll just print our ID. Okay. So let's create a configuration for network. Uh, so new configuration type network in here and then select that path and then let's test if this is working. So remember what I said when we're going to connect right uh, to our server, what we have to do is first run that server script. So let's run the server script here waiting for connection server started. Okay, let's run this network script now. Uh, invalid argument was supplied s dot listen to hmm. Okay, so I had a quick look here. Uh, I realized the mistake was I was actually running this server two times. So obviously that's not going to work for us. So we can put two back in this listen. I'm not sure if you guys will see if I left that in the video or not. Uh, but let's go to network. And we also need to change this to AF instead of IF. I don't know why I typed IF. I literally said AF when I was typing it, but that's fine. Uh, and we have server. I'm actually running it right now. So make sure you guys run that. And then let's run network and see if this works. Okay, sweet. So um, I know it doesn't seem like much, but you can check here if we go to server, it says connected to and then gives us that address. Uh, and it's also printing out some other thing that I honestly don't know what that means. Uh, and then it's saying disconnected and lost connection. Sweet. That's actually really good. And that means that we're everything is working. And you can also see that we have connected being printed here. So that means when we connect to the server, we're actually getting the value that it's sending. So we're getting this uh, connected and we're printing it out, uh, decoding it all fine. So that's really awesome. So now the only next step is to actually send information to the server and keep like a loop going, like sending, receiving, sending, receiving, sending, receiving. Now let's actually just test um, if I run this again, uh, you can see again, obviously it's working again. So this is the server just continually is running. I don't actually have to stop this unless I wanna make modifications to it. Uh, so let's just keep that running for now. And let's add something to our network class. So in our network class, we're going to define a method that's going to be sent. Now this method is going to be very useful later on because it's going to save us a lot of time. So in send, we're just going to take a string, which is going to be data. Okay. And all we're going to do in here is we're going to try to self dot client dot send. And we're going to say data str actually dot encode data. And then we're going to get a reply from that server. So we're going to say return. So exact same thing that we're doing here self.client.receive uh, 2048.decode and we'll accept and I believe this is a socket error. Yeah, it is socket.error as E and just print E. So if we get into some error where, you know, either we're sending or we're receiving and it's not working, let's just print that error out to the screen so we have a look at what that really means. So now let's do a test. Um, and trying to send information to the server and then get something back. Okay. Now the information that we're getting back should just be the same information because that's what we have in server. We're just going to send exactly what we got right back. Right. So um, it doesn't really make sense right now to do that, but we'll talk about like what we can, what valid information we can send, how to send, receive information in the next video when we connect up the client uh, to the thing. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to say n dot send and we'll print n dot send. Okay. And we'll print n dot send again. And let's just send like a few bits of information and see if everything is indeed working. Okay. So n dot send. Uh, and then in here, let's just type hello and we'll type working. Okay. And see if this works. So we have actually, we should have, yes, yeah, server is working. Well, let's run our client. And you can see we get connected, hello working. And if we come here, it says received hello, sending hello, received working, sending working. So that's awesome. Um, that means our network class is working, sending information, receiving information is working, server is working. Uh, and now the only thing that's left to do essentially is to connect that up to this. So use this network class in some meaningful way here, and then to actually store information on the server and then send that information to multiple clients, which we'll be doing in future videos.
what we're going to be doing is we're going to be hooking up our graphical client to our server so that we can send information back and forth and ideally at the end of this video what we're going to have is we're going to have two rectangles on each client so we'll have like two clients running and when you move the rectangle on one client it moves on the other and vice versa okay so you guys will get the idea when we go through but there's a little bit of work we have to do and we're going to be modifying a few things within a lot of the files we've already created so just make sure you guys are paying attention and again if anything is going wrong feel free to download all of the code off of techwithtim.net uh, it'll be available there and it'll be exactly the same code that i'm writing right now okay uh, so first thing we're going to do is in this network class we're just going to delete a few things so this testing stuff we don't need anymore um, this print statement for the self.id we don't need that and we're actually going to change this self.id to be self.pause okay and you guys will see why we're doing that in a second um, and we're going to add one quick method in here and we're just going to say define get pause okay and all we're going to do here is just return self.pause all right and again we'll you'll see why we're doing that but i just don't want to have to come back to this network class so we'll do that right now okay so i'm from inside our client now what we're going to do is we're going to import this network class because we're going to use it in here so we're going to say from network uh import network and then in our main uh, function down here what we're going to do is actually above player we're going to say n equals network okay like that and then what we're going to do is we're going to say start pause equals n dot get pause so essentially why I'm doing this is because when we first connect to our server, what I want to happen is I want it to return to each of our clients the starting position of their character, right? Or of their cube, okay? Because it's going to depend where they're starting based on if they're player one or if they're player two. So then on the client side, what we're going to do is when we initially connect to the server, which is what we're doing when we create this network object, we're connecting to the server. We're going to get that starting position. And then for creating our own player, we're going to use that starting position to determine like where we're starting. So the position is going to come in as a tuple. All right. And we'll be coding all this on the server side in a second, but it's easier just to go through each file rather than going back and forth. It's going to come through as a tuple that looks something like this. So it'll be like 50, 100. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do is we are going to read this tuple in because it's actually going to come in as a string like we're, uh, you'll see how it comes in. We're going to get the two aspects of it. It's so like the X value and the Y value. And then we're going to use that inside of this player um, initialization to like set the initial position. So that uh, reminds me what we're going to be doing when we're sending information to the server is we're going to send it using string data, right? And that's what we were doing in the last video is we were sending everything with strings. So we were sending like hello, and then we were decoding it and encoding it. Now, this is not the only way we can send information. We can actually send information with objects. And I'm going to show you the advantage of doing that in the next video. But for now, we're just going to send strings. So since we're going to be sending strings, um, the strings that I want to send are positions, OK? I want to, from each client, send the current client's position to the server. The server is going to get that position, update it on the server side, and then send the other client's position back to um, the client. You guys will see how it works in a second. Uh, actually, let's see if I can do a quick drawing to illustrate this because it'll make things a bit easier. Okay, let's, um, I don't know why I had this. Let's delete that. Okay, so let's do a quick drawing. So what we're going to have is we're going to have client one. And excuse me, because I'm drawing this with a mouse and client two. Okay, so this is gonna be one and this is gonna be two. All right, this we'll do it as a red box is gonna be our server. And on the server, what we're gonna do is we're gonna store positions. So we'll say like one has position like one, two. Okay, sorry, this is hard with the mouse, guys. And then client two will have position like three and one. Okay, so it's gonna store these positions. So what's gonna happen is when we initially connect, client one is gonna go to the server, it's gonna connect to it. And then it's going to be sent back the starting position for the client. Okay. So it's going to be said, okay, so you're client one. So that means you're going to start at position one, two client two. It's going to connect. It's going to say, okay, we're client two. So I need to send client two's position. So let's send that back. All right. Now let's say we've already connected client one's there, clients two's there, and we've set their starting positions. What we're going to do next is now we're going to continually call to the client and update the position. So what we're going to do is say, let's it's, say we're working with client one okay um what it's going to do is it's going to send its position to the server so it's going to say um let's just say pause okay it's sending its current position let's say that position is like four uh five sorry this is really hard with the mouse okay four five what's going to happen here is we're going to say okay so you're updating your position 
So then it's gonna go in here. It's gonna say, okay, client one will update your position to be four, five, like that, okay? And then what it's gonna do is instead of sending back the same position, because we already know what the position is, it's gonna send back the position of client two. So it's gonna send three, one, and then on here we can draw that client so that it looks like um, it's moving, right? So we're getting, we're sending our information and then in return we're receiving the other client's information. Now the same thing works here with client two. So if client two connects, right? And it's sending information, it's gonna send its position. Let's say it sends the position one, three, okay? That's its updated position. So this is gonna change to be one and three. And then what's gonna happen is it's gonna say, okay, well, we don't need client two's position. We need client one. So what's client one position? Well, that is four five. So let's send four five over to client two. And then on client two, we can draw four five. So you'll see um, they'll simultaneously be moving. I hope that makes sense. I just want to draw it out for you so you guys know what I'm about to do in this video. Okay, perfect. Now, the only thing is we need to send these positions as strings. So we're actually gonna have to implement two helper methods so that we can convert those positions, which are gonna be tuples into strings. And then we can also uh, read the string into a tuple. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say define, and I wanna remember what I called this one. We'll say this one is read underscore position, which means we're gonna take a string value and we're just gonna read the string in. So we'll say str equals str dot split, and we'll split it at a comma, okay? And you guys will see how this works in a second. And then what we're gonna do is we're simply gonna return the int of string zero, so str zero, okay? comma int of str one. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a string in that looks something like this. It'd be like 45 comma 67, okay? Um, in, in string value, 45, 67. We're gonna split it, which means we're gonna get a list that has the string 45 and the string 67. And then we're just gonna convert those to ints and return them as a tuple. So now we get that converted to something that looks like this, which is useful information that we can actually use, okay? So that's what read pause is going to do, but we need to make one more, which is going to convert that position into a string. So we're going to say uh, make underscore position. And in here, what we're going to have is we're going to take a tuple. So let's we'll say tup standing for tuple. And what we'll do here is we'll say, um, let's see here, return uh, tup, actually str of tup zero. And then we're gonna add that comma in. So sorry, I'm butchering my typing right now. Comma plus str of top one. And I hope that makes sense how we do that. So that's returning the string value. So we're reading pause and making pause. Um, and that's all we need to do for those helper functions. Okay, so that means though, that when we get the position initially from our server, it's gonna come in in that string value, right? It's gonna look like 45, 67. So we need to convert that. So what we'll do is we'll say, read pause and we'll just put that around n dot get pause because it's going to return to us that string position so we'll read it in and now what we're going to do is for our player we're going to say start pause zero and start pause one okay and what this is going to do is just set it to the initial start position we're going to code all the server stuff after it'll start making a lot more sense okay now what we also need to do is we need to create a second player because we're gonna have to draw the first player and the second player on the screen, right? So we're gonna say P2 equals, and we're literally just gonna copy this, except um, for start position, we're just gonna put it as zero, zero for right now. And we'll update that in a second, okay? So we have P, P2, um, and for now, that's what we'll do. Actually, let's, we can continue working in here so that we don't have to do anything else in here after. We'll just code the server side. So what we'll do now is we're gonna send our current position to the server, right? That's like the algorithm we've developed. Essentially, we are when we connect, we're gonna get the starting position, we're gonna set that starting position, and then every time after that, so like every time the frame updates, we're going to send our position and then get the other person's position. So what we're gonna say is we're gonna say um, p2 pause is gonna be equal to n dot send, okay? And we're gonna send make position of and then what we're gonna have to do in here is it's a little sketchy, but we're gonna do p dot x, p dot y. Now, right, because that's the position of our player, the x and the y coordinate, we're putting it in tuple form, we're sending it to the function make position, which is gonna turn it into a string, and then we're sending it to the server, right? Okay, awesome, so I think that makes sense. And then what we're gonna do simply is for p2, we're going to update is its position. So we'll say p2 dot x is gonna be equal to, uh, actually, 
and two dot send. But we'll, what we're gonna have to put around here, sorry, is make pause read pause because right it's coming in as a string, so we need to convert this into an actual position. So p two pause is gonna be p two position zero, and then p two dot y is gonna be equal to p two p two pause one. Okay. Now the only thing that's left to do here is what do you call it? Draw p two and update p2's rectangle. So what we're gonna do now is in the redraw window down here, we're gonna put p2, we're gonna go to redraw window, we're gonna say player two here, and then we're gonna do player two dot draw window, because again, it's gonna be a player object, so that'll be fine. And then last thing to do is just update the rectangle. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say p2 dot update, and we're gonna go to player object now, we're just gonna add this one function that is define update and then, so you see, I just made like self.rect equals x, y with height. And then in here, I'm just going to say self.update like this, okay? Um, so I know these might be getting a bit confusing, but we're almost finished. I just got to do the server side, and then we'll recap through everything, what we've done, explain things. I just kind of have to get this content out. Uh, okay, so define update. So what we're doing again here is before, we just had this line of code here. Um, so we're just replacing that with an update method. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. I hope that makes sense to you guys. And that's just again, so when we change the X and we change the Y value of P2 directly, then we are updating the rectangle. So when we draw it to the screen, it's in the correct position. Okay, so I believe that's all I have to do for the client side. So now it's time to go to the server side and the server side is pretty straightforward. Now the server needs to keep track of the positions, right? It needs to hold player one's position and players two position um, consistently. So we can decide if we want to store that, let's say like on a hard drive, or if we want to store that in memory. Now in our case, it's not a lot of information. So we're just going to store it in the memory of the server, right? So what we'll do for that is we're going to create a list and we're going to say pause equals and just a blank list. And this list is going to hold the positions of our players. Now, actually that reminds me, we're going to put two tuples in here. And these are going to represent, sorry, the starting positions of our players. So we'll start with zero, zero, and like 100, 100. So player one will start at 0, 0, player two will start at 100, 100, okay? And that's all we're gonna do for that little list there. And then what we're gonna do down here, uh, well, this while loop is, we're gonna keep track of how many players have connected. In our case, we only want two to connect, right? Um, and then we need to keep track of, well, those players. So we're gonna say, we're gonna say current player equals zero. Now, this is because when we connect, we're gonna add one to this, so that when we go back into this function, it'll be, you, you guys will see how it works. But essentially, every time we create a new connection, so every time this, we accept a new connection, we're gonna add one to our current player. So we'll actually do it at the bottom of the while loop. We'll say current player plus equals one. This is just to keep track of which player we're using so that we know what position to update, what position to send to that player based on the connection, right? Okay, so keep track of current player. And now what we're gonna do is when we start this new thread, so this threaded client, we're also gonna pass another argument, which is gonna be the current player. So instead of just passing connection, we're also gonna pass player in here, okay? Uh, current player, like that, okay? Because that's gonna be important information to know. All right, so we're actually almost finished. We just gotta update a few things. So let's actually grab um, these two methods from our client class or client file and throw them onto server here. So we're just gonna put them right above position because we're gonna need to use them. Read, pause and make pause. So now when we initially connect to our player, right? This is what happens when we initially connect. The first thing that's sent is this encoded uh, message that is connected. Now in our case, what we wanna send is we wanna send the starting position. So how do we do that? Well, we know what player we are. We're either player zero or we're either player one, right? Because we only have two players. When we start with player zero, after player zero connects, then we do player one, right? So what we'll do is we're gonna send pause player. Now that won't work because it's just a tuple, right? We need to first convert that to a string and then encode that string and send it. So let's actually go back here. I wanna keep this string.encode. So string.encode and we'll say make underscore or oh, pause. And then we'll just put pause player in here. And what that'll do is it'll convert it into a string for us and then it'll send that uh, to the player for us, right? And then they'll read that string in, convert it to a position and update the position accordingly. Okay, making sense? Hope so. Okay, so that's how that works for player. Now the only thing we need to change now is what information we are 
sending um, every time this loop is running, right? Every time we receive something from the player, we want to send back the other player's position. So to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to say con.receive.decode. So we'll get rid of this for now. And then what we're going to say is we're going to turn this data into uh, like readable, a readable tuple, right? So to do that, uh, we are going to use the read position method that we've already created or function. So say read pause con.receive and we'll turn that into from that string like this, right? Or whatever it was like 45, 67, we'll turn that into something that looks like this so that we can actually use it. Okay. So now that we have that, it's turned into that. What we're going to do is we're going to update our current player's position. So we're going to say pause player equals data, right? Because this is the position they sent to us. So let's update it on the server. Uh, so yeah, so it's updated information. Okay, sweet. So we've done that. Now all that's left to do is send the other player's position back to uh, our client. So to do that, what we can do is simply say reply equals, and we're just going to say pause, or actually, uh, let's not do it up here. Let's do it down here. Okay, we're going to say if player equals equals one. So if we're player one, we're going to send player zero position, right? So we'll say reply equals, and then pause player uh, or not pause, not, not player zero, sorry. And then else we're going to send, so we'll say reply equals pause one. Okay. So if we're player one, we send player zero position. If we're player zero, we send players one position, right? Like I was talking about with that little algorithm we're going to use. Okay. And then instead of saying received and sending actually, yeah, we can say received reply, sending reply, or we'll say received data, sending reply. That should work fine. Okay. Uh, now what we'll do is we're going to send all the reply, but the thing is our reply, we need to first convert into a string. So to do that, we're going to say make underscore pause, right? That function we've already created. And then that should actually be about it. Now I'm probably made a mistake or two here, but let's just test this out and see if everything's working. So let's start by running the server and then let's run two clients and see if we can connect or if there's any errors. Okay. So we've connected with client one. Let's run client two and let's see what happens. So I'm on client one right now and you can see that when I move my green square, it moves on the other client. Okay. Let's go to the other one. And when you look at this, when I move it on here, it moves on the other client. So we have successfully set up and connected our two clients together. Now, the only thing I want to change quickly is just the color of these so that we know who is who, like which square am I? Um, so to do this, we're just simply going to go, uh, we'll actually close the server class. Otherwise you're going to run into an issue or server instance, whatever it is. We'll go to client and instead of having the same color here, we're just going to change this to be 255 for player two. And now I want to show you what happens because some of you are probably going to be confused with what's about to happen here, but it's kind of interesting. So let's run server. Let's run client one. Let's run client two. Now notice that these colors are inverted. Now, can anyone think of why that might be? So green, right, is going to be uh, your current player. So right now I'm on here, I'm on this where my mouse is, and I'm moving the green square that's near the middle of the screen, okay? But notice on the other screen, it's moving the red square. That's because on your client, it's unique to you. So on your client, you are green and red is the other person. Meanwhile, if I go to this client and I start moving, see green is me and red is the other guy, right? And he's not currently moving. Now, if I wanted to move these at the same time, I would just have to be running these on different computers or I would have to change like the arrow keys to move them. And that's just because obviously, right? Like if I'm pressing the arrow keys on here, it's not gonna work on this client. But if I were to load up my laptop and try doing it on there, um, this would work fine as well. there's quite a few issues that we may run into when we're doing this. So I've set this up essentially to be kind of like an example program or like an example problem um, to give you guys an idea of the way we go about doing things in terms of server and network, but it's really not ideal the way that we've coded things so far. Now I did plan this for uh, to do what we're about to do, but essentially I'm going to redo um, what we've just done in a much more elegant and nicer way that's going to allow for a better scalability of this uh, program, okay? So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna redo it here. I'm gonna show you how we can actually send physical, oh, not physical, but like send objects uh, to the server and from the server back to the client rather than just string data. 
And then in the next videos, we're actually going to scrap all this code that we've written and we're going to start from fresh and code uh, like a networking game. It's going to be a lot more complex than just a few squares moving around the screen. So that's my plan for this series. Let me know what you guys think of that. I know it might be a little bit frustrating to get rid of this code, but now that we understand how a lot of this works, uh, it's going to be really fast to rewrite it in a much more elegant way. So uh, what I need to first start by doing it's just taking this player class, okay? And I'm just gonna copy it into its own file. So really straightforward, I'm just gonna go to new Python file. I'm gonna call this player with a lowercase and then just copy that player class in there and just import pygame up here, okay? Import pygame. Now I'm just gonna go back into client. We can delete this player class now. And what I'm gonna do really basically is just from player import player like that, okay? And that's the first step. Now, remember I said we were going to send objects. So that actually means that we're not going to need this read pause and make pause thing. And it's kind of annoying how we've had to, well, take that tuple object, decompose it, turn it into integers, and then change object properties. And then when we want to send something, we got to put it into a string and we got to send it. And it's just a pain. And we don't want to have to do that, especially when we're sending tons of different bits of information, not just that same positional data, right? So we're actually going to delete this and we can delete this client number. I don't know why I have that there. Um, and we're going to start just making some modifications in terms of sending data and receiving data. So we'll start on the client side and then we'll go over the network, uh, the server side and fix some of that. So wherever we see like read pause and make pause, we can just get rid of that for right now. Um, we don't actually need any of that. We're not going to need this p2.x stuff. Uh, we don't need p2.update. We'll, we'll get rid of all this for right now. And you know, what? actually, let's get rid of start position. Let's get rid of p and let's get rid of p2. And we're going to recode all this, okay? So actually, um, p2, p, yeah, that can stay there. p.move is fine. Okay, so we got rid of all that. And you can see we've just cleaned up this file a bit. And we'll start working with some more stuff in a second. Now, what I want to do actually is go to this network file that we have. Um, and we're going to start making some modifications in here as well. So what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be sending objects. So that means we're gonna send like an instance of the player class. Uh, and that's actually what we're gonna be sending, instance of a player class to our server, as opposed to sending like string data and then updating the object on, or then updating the string data on the server and then sending it back and then updating the object. That's just a lot of work. It's a lot easier just to send the actual object. So we can do that using something called pickle, okay? Now it's a weird module name, but it comes default with Python. And this allows us to do something that's called serialize objects. And that just means we turn it into byte information, which is like all the zeros and ones, send it over the, uh, what do you call it? Send it over the network. And then we can decompose that, turn it back into an object and use that. And it's really easy to do that. So what we're gonna do here is we're just gonna modify a few things in our uh, network class. So first thing, instead of having self.pause, we're gonna say self dot um, P okay. This is going to be equal to self dot connect. Instead of saying get um, position, we'll just do get P and then we'll return self dot P. Okay. And that's all we need to modify for that. But now in the connect in the send, we're going to change a few things as well. So since we're going to be getting object data, what we have to do in the connect is we have to decompose that object data. So to do that, you do pickle dot loads okay now what this stands for is it stands for load byte data okay and we'll we'll talk more about this as we keep going through but that's essentially what it means and same thing here in send instead of encoding this data what we're going to do and i guess decoding as well is we're going to um, dump it into a pickle object and then send it so to do that we're going to just say pickle uh is that a spell pickle yeah dot dot dumps like that and we'll just put data in there okay and then when we receive we'll do the same thing as before we'll say pickle dot loads and then we'll load that in so now essentially what we're doing is we're going to be receiving an object decomposing that object getting the actual object not the bytes um, form of it and then when we're sending it we're gonna first like what do you call it encrypt it like send it into that byte information and then on the server side we'll decompose that as well okay so we'll we'll go through that but that's all we need for the network side so now let's go to server and start making some modifications so same thing here we no longer need this read pause and make pause functions we're not going to be using those um, and we don't need this pause list either we're going to change this actually to be players and it's going to be equal to two new players. So notice that we're going to actually store the player object on the server. 
as opposed to on the client side. And this is not only like safer because it means that the player technically can't really mess with the player objects. They can only like do commands to update them. Um, but it's also just like, it's gonna be a lot easier. And you guys will see how it works. We're gonna say player and we'll do another instance of player. And in here, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna create two new players. So we're gonna say 0, 0, 50, 50, and we'll give it a color. In this case, the first color will be red. So we'll say red, green, blue, like that. And for the other player, we'll start him at 100, 100, like before, we'll do 50, 50, and then we'll make his color uh, blue. Why not? So we'll do that, okay? So now you notice that we're getting a little error for player here, just because we forgot to import it. So we say from player, import player, like that. Uh, and that's why I made this new file, by the way, just so that we'd be able to see it from the server side and the client side as well. And then wherever we're doing this, like send um, encoding stuff, we're going to change this. So let's do that now, actually. So instead of con.send, instead of encoding some string information, we're just going to send the player object. So what we'll do is we'll say players like this and then player, right? So exact same kind of concept as before in that we're going to send the initial like starting position of the player uh, or like the, but in this case, we're just sending the initial player object, which means any information that's stored in that player will be given to the client as opposed to just the position. Okay. Um, so next what we'll do is instead of saying data equals read pause and decoding, we're going to get rid of this dot decode and we're going to put pickle dot loads. Okay. And actually when I'm sending this player object, my bad here, guys, we got to do pickle dot dumps. Okay. And then we're just gonna have to import pickle up here. So import pickle. All right, sweet. Okay, so pickle dot loads pickle dot dumps. And then it's obviously instead of pause player equals data, we're gonna say player players player equals data. And again, same concept as before, what's going to happen is the what do you call it? the client is going to send us a player object, we're going to replace the existing player object with that new player object. And then we're going to send back the other player objects like the other client. Okay. So now what we're going to do is just change these pause to be player or players like that. Okay. Same thing here players. And then when we send it back, what we'll do is we will just turn it into a uh, object, right? So we'll just do that pickle dot dumps and send it back. So say pickle dot dumps reply like that. And that should actually be about it. So let's go back. Oh, sorry. There's something we need to do in client. Um, so now what we're going to do is essentially we've set up our network class so that we're going to be able to send that object data. We've set up the server, so we're going to be able to receive that um, object data. We're going to modify the objects we're storing in the list here, and then we're going to send back the other one, so the other client. So in client, all we have to do now is set up player one and player two, and then send that data. So really straightforward. It's very similar to before. What we're going to do first of all, we're going to say p1, or actually just p, I guess, is equal to n dot get p. Okay because in the network uh, class, remember what we're doing is when we initially connect, so let's go back to server, we're just gonna send the initial player object, which is gonna be whatever player it is, so zero or one. So let's just say that this client's player object uh, is gonna be n.getp, okay? And then we'll say, actually, I think that's all we have to do for, yeah, that is all we have to do for that. Inside this while loop now, what we're gonna do is every frame, we're gonna send this player object, which will be updating with p.move, and we'll just get the reply and say that that's P2. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say P2 equals, and then in this case, we'll just say P dot, or not P, N dot send P. And that's all we have to do. And notice here that we don't have to do with all this like make, uh, what do you call it? Make pause, read pause, all that stuff. And I believe this should be working if I didn't make any mistakes. So let's cross the fingers and let's try this out. Uh, waiting for connection, let's go to client one run that okay and client two running that and now notice that these rectangles are the same color and watch what happens if i move this red one see how it's red on the other screen as well 
Now that already shows us one of the advantages of doing it this way is that we can store information like color as well, not just position. And if we wanted to store, maybe like there was a text attribute on each of these players, we could store that as well. If we wanted to store more information in the player, like a health or something like that, it'd be a lot easier to do that by just sending the actual player object that has like an unlimited amount of attributes rather than just sending that little tuple that has like five, six, right? Which is the position. So the reason I went through the trouble of showing you the other way is to show you the massive advantage of doing it this way. And just to give you kind of perspective, if you're making something really simple and you don't use any objects, that's how you can do it with string data. But I think this way is a lot easier and we've just cleaned up quite a bit of code. We've gotten rid of a bunch of functions and moving forward, this is gonna make things a lot easier for us. I'm pretty much going to be gutting everything we already did. Uh, we'll keep a little bit of it, but we're just going to really add to a bunch of that and just, yeah, we're going to be gutting most of it. Uh, and we're actually going to be working to create online rock, paper, scissors. Now I know this sounds like kind of a lame game, but let me show you because it's actually pretty complex. And if you can understand how to make this game, then you're going to be able to understand how to make any other kind of online game because the principles are the same in terms of sending information, waiting for players to go. Uh, and there's a lot of different things that you might not think about that we actually have to do to code something like online rock, paper, scissors. Okay, so let's, this is client number one. I'm just running another pie game window uh, or pie charm window with the server running on it. And you can see, obviously it's a bit oversized, but it says waiting for player. Okay, so I'm going to launch another client. And then, <coughs> excuse me, you can see when I launch that, it loads both of them up into the game and it says your move, opponents, your move, opponents, and currently it's waiting. So I believe this one's player two and this one's player one. So if I make a move here on, uh, let's say rock, it'll lock in my move. It says your move is rock. And then over here, it says, obviously the opponent's move is locked in because it's like looking for this guy's move. And now if he makes a move, like let's say scissors, then it says you win, you lost. And then it just resets and you can keep playing games. Now I'm also going to be adding more to this. This is just like the beta version. I'm going to have wins, ties and losses, keeping track in the top hand corner. And when you load in, you're going to be brought to a menu screen, which will allow you to like start a new game or to leave or we'll, we'll add that later as we go. But this is the main functioning game. And you can see, obviously it's working well, tie game. Um, and it restarts. This also allows for unlimited amount of clients to play. So for example, if I launch another two windows, you can see these guys now have their own game going. Um, it's kind of difficult because I can't really get four on the screen. But anyways, if I go like scissors, paper, that works independently of these games and these games can kind of play at their own time, which is really interesting and really cool. And if you disconnect one of them, it automatically disconnects the pair. And that's just because uh, obviously you can't play against no one, right? So yeah. Okay, sweet. So that's that. Um, let's start getting into the code. Okay, so first thing we're going to do is we're actually going to code a, uh, a game class. Okay, and this is just going to be responsible for holding all the information for our game that we need. So for example, did player one go yet? Did player two go yet? What move did player one make? What move did player two make? Are both of them connected to the server? Information like that. And you guys will see how much information we actually need. It's also going to store things like keeping track of who won or who lost. Um, how many ties, how many wins. So that's what we're going to do with this game class. So let's start making it. So class game, I'm doing this in its own file, by the way, um, just called game. You are going to need it in its own file because it's going to have to be accessed by both the client and the server. Okay. We're going to define our initialization. Uh, in here, we're going to take ID. I'm going to say self dot P one went equals false uh, self dot P two went equals false. And obviously you guys know what this is going to do. It's just going to stand for if player one has made a move or not, if player two has made a move, we're going to do self dot ready equals false. Uh, if I could type that correctly, we're also going to add self dot ID. So self dot ID equals ID. And this is just going to stand for the current games ID. So each game we create is going to have its own unique numeric ID so that we can determine who is like what clients are a part of what game and whatnot. Uh, we're gonna do self dot moves equals, and then we'll just do none and none in here because currently the moves are none, but we'll just store two positions so we can change that. We'll say self dot wins equals, and then zero, zero. Obviously this one is gonna stand for player one. This one's gonna stand for player two. And we'll say self dot ties equals zero. That's all we need for the init. So the next one is gonna say get underscore player underscore move. Now what this is going to do is 
exactly what it says it's just going to get i don't know how i added that there it's just going to get the player move that we asked for so we're going to take p which is going to be either zero or one and what we're going to do is simply return self dot moves and p and just to remind ourselves we'll say that p is in the range of zero and one so we're only going to take value zero or one and then we're going to return uh, a move so let's say move here okay and that's just to remind ourselves that we have to pass zero or one obviously zero is going to represent player one and one is going to represent player two okay next one play so this one's a bit more complicated not crazy we're going to take play we're going to take a player and we're going to take a move and what this is going to do is it's simply going to update um, our moves list with that player's move pretty straightforward so what we're going to do here is we're just going to say if player equals equals zero then what we'll do is we'll say self dot moves zero equals move um oh actually you know what let's do this sorry i'm just looking at my other screen right now we'll say self dot moves player equals move but now what we have to do is based on the player we have to update if p1 went or p2 went okay so what we'll do in here is if it's player one obviously we'll do p1 went um equals true gonna need a self before that and then we'll call we'll just do a little else here because if it's not player zero it must be player one so we'll say self dot p2 went if i could spell went equals true so that'll just keep track of if we've gone or not sweet next method this one's really easy it's going to be called connected and this is just going to tell us if the two players are currently connected to the um, game if they are it'll allow us to load in and that's how we can determine whether we should show waiting for player or not on the screen right so we'll say return self dot ready and that's just going to tell us obviously if we're ready and that'll be updated from the server side which we'll do later next method define uh both went this is just simply going to return if both of our players went so to do that we're just going to say self dot p1 went and why can i not spell that word and self dot p2 went like that okay next one is winner this one is a bit more complicated but it's just going to keep track of where it's actually going to tell us who's won the game so if we call this method we're assuming that both players have gone we're going to check their moves excuse me against one another and see if they won so we're actually going to have to check nine possible cases because there's three moves each player could do three times three nine um so what we'll start by doing is we'll just say p1 equals self dot moves um zero dot upper and then zero the reason we're doing this is because we just want to get the first letter of the move because the move is going to be stored as rock paper or scissors the string and it's just going to be easier for us to type out um for example r or s or what do you call it or p to check the moves as opposed to having to check the entire word so we're just going to get that first letter by doing move zero we're going to upper it and then we're going to take that first letter we're going to do the exact same thing for p2 except obviously we're going to need um oh i don't know what i did there we're going to need moves one dot upper and now we can start checking to see who's won so we're going to say to start winner is equal to negative one now that's because there could be no winner there could be a tie so if it's tied we're going to say negative one if uh, player one is the winner it's going to be zero if player two is the winner it's going to be one okay so what we're going to do is we're going to say if p1 equals equals r and p2 equals equals scissors what we'll do is we'll say winner equals zero because player one won that we'll say l if p1 equals equals s and p2 equals equals r then we'll say winner equals one i believe do another lf and i know this is tedious but this is the way you have to check for rock paper scissors i don't think there's an easier way to do it if you know an easier way let me know and p2 equals equals r and if you guys don't want to type this you can always copy it from my website uh, techwithtim.net okay so say winner equals paper beats rocks so that'd be winner equals one or zero sorry we'll say l if p1 equals equals r and p2 equals equals p then winner equals one and we've just got two last ones to check here so we'll say l if p1 equals equals uh, s and p2 equals equals r and then p2 is the winner so winner equals one 
believe that's oh sorry i might have messed this up this should be p i think so p rock rock paper scissors paper yeah winner equals zero um okay l if p1 equals equals paper and p2 equals equals scissors then winner equals one and i believe that should be correct one two three four five six okay sweet and then the other cases are if it's a tie so if none of this is the case then they must have tied and then all we're going to do is simply return winner like that okay and one very last method then we're actually done with this class we can move to something else is define reset went and all this is going to do is say self dot p1 went equals false and self dot p2 went equals false pretty straightforward and this is the game class i know i kind of sped through this but it's pretty trivial how this works uh we just need to get this out of the way so we can start coding some other stuff okay sweet so we've done this class um next thing i think we want to work on is network so network actually you guys are going to have to modify yours to look like mine now get p and uh what do you call it so this first half so init and get p are going to be the same as what we had previously the only thing that's changed is connect and this send so in connect instead of um what do you call it like unpickling an object so like pickle dot loads what we're simply doing is we're going to just connect to the client like we did before but instead of unpickling it we're just going to decode it so we're going to say self.client.receive 2048.decode um, we'll return that value and that's because when we initially connect to the server what we're going to get from the server is our player number which means we're either player zero or we're player one now that's important because that's going to determine where on the screen we're drawing certain things and how we're sending information back to the server and updating player one or player two right because technically each player thinks that they're player one but each one needs to be assigned either a zero or a one by the computer so we know where to store information right okay so that's how we modify that just do decode instead of pickling um sending i believe is the same except what we're going to do is instead of pickling an object to send we're simply going to send a string and we're going to load an object so that means we're going to send string data to the server and we're going to receive back object data so when we receive something we have to pickle dot loads it in but when we're sending it we just have to encode the string okay so just make sure it looks like this uh, i don't think i need to go through this we've already done this for the past two three videos and that's the network class so game and network are done um, the next things to do are server and client now server and client are a bit more complicated so inside of server i guess we could do this first because it doesn't really depend on the client to work where the client kind of depends on the server we're gonna change a bunch of things so this is what it mine looks like now i've kind of gutted the entire threaded client i got rid of most of the stuff like most of the other stuff i uh, just left this beginning thing so the, the server ip the port um the socket connecting listening waiting for connection so by the way some of you were saying you're having issues with fs dot listen you can just make this zero it doesn't really matter um what's in here and some of you were saying like you're having issues just you can just delete it and type it in again and apparently that works that's what someone said so i don't know don't ask me about that but if you're running into issues do that okay so what we're going to do now is we want to make it so you can have unlimited connections at once now that means we're going to have to have unlimited games running at the same time so before what we were doing when we had those players moving around the screen is we were just storing like player one player two and we just had a list that had two entries that's how we were doing that what we're going to do now is we're going to have a list that contains a bunch of different games and those games actually you're sorry it's going to be a dictionary those games will be accessed by their id and you guys will see how this works um, it's a bit complicated but just follow along um, and yeah so i gotta just open up my other file so i don't make any mistakes here okay so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do uh, connected equals set we're just gonna define some variables we'll talk about what these do games equals a blank dictionary and id count equals zero so the reason we're adding these is games this dictionary is going to store our games so it's going to have an id as a key and the game as like a game object like this okay as the value this connected is just going to store the ip addresses of the connected clients um, we're storing in a set just so it's easier to access later i don't actually know if we use this we might um but we'll see okay id count obviously is just going to keep track of our current id so that means what game we should recreate so we don't override games and say like two games have the same id because obviously we can't have that happening 
Okay, so that's fine for that. We're not going to deal with anything in Threaded Client right now. We're going to go down to our while loop, and this is where we're going to create new games based on new people joining or possibly delete games. Uh, actually, we'll delete games from Threaded Client. So what we're going to do right now is when someone connects, this this runs, right? And we run a new. So like once we accept a connection, everything after this runs. So what we're going to do is we're going to say id count plus equals one. If you notice me looking away, I'm just looking at my other screen to make sure I don't make any mistakes on this. Now, what ID count plus equals one is going to do, obviously, is it's going to keep track of how many people are connected to the um, the server at once. Because obviously, right, like once this happens, we accept, then we go down the while loop, we start a new thread, and then we wait for another connection. So we're just going to keep track of that. What we're going to do is we're going to say P equals zero, just standing for the current player. And we're going to say game ID equals, and this is going to be weird, but just follow along with me. Uh, what do you call it? ID count minus one integer division two. Now, what this is going to do is essentially every two people that connect to the server, we're going to increment game ID by one. And what game ID is going to be, or we'll say it's, yeah, we'll add it by one. What game ID is going to do is keep track of what ID our game is going to be. So, like, for example, if we have 10 people connected to the server, we're going to have five games, right? So that's what this line of code is doing for us. It's keeping track of how many games or if we need to add a new game. Because obviously, if we have like six people connected, all of them are going to be playing each other, a seventh person connects, well, it doesn't have a game to join, we have to create a new game for it to join. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so what we'll do next, is we'll say if ID count modulus two equals equals one, and what this is going to stand for is if you're going to be player one or player two. And if this happens is actually we need to create a new game because this means that we don't have a pair for our new player. So, for example, like say this number is three, that means two people are already playing. So that's one person just connected. So we need to create a new game. That's what this modulus two is getting. OK, so to do that, we're going to say games game ID equals game game ID. Okay. And I believe this actually has to be capital. So obviously, uh, sorry, at the beginning of this, I forgot to mention I import a game. So from game import game, that is important. And yeah, that's essentially what we're doing is we're just going to say that um, game ID, which is that key in our dictionary is now equal to a new game. So we can access that and add players to it and whatnot. Sweet. So that works. Let's actually print out a message here and just say, creating a new game dot 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 just so that in our server we get some kind of output and we can have a look at that if something's going wrong so otherwise if there we don't need to create a new game meaning we have let's say three people are connected so that second game already exists and another person connects well that person has to be a part of this new game so what we're going to do then is we're going to say games game id dot ready equals true now what this means is that the second player connected, so there's two players now connected to our game. So now we can say that that game is ready to start playing because both the players are connected. So that means that they can, well, obviously play against each other, right? So that's what we'll do. We'll set that dot ready equal to true. And obviously we're storing all the games on the server side as opposed to on the client side. And then what we're gonna say is we're gonna say P equals one. And what this means is player equals one. And you'll see why we need to do this in a second. Okay, so now we're gonna do start new thread. Now notice in start new thread, I added two new uh, parameters, P and game ID. So this means the current player, so it's either player zero or player one, and the game ID. And game ID is gonna stand for which game in this game's dictionary are we playing in this threaded client? Like which one of our clients that's connected here uh, is playing which game? That's why we need that. So let's pass that information. So we're gonna pass P, which is either gonna be zero or one, like we have there, and we're gonna pass game ID. And then we'll have that up here. And just remember that threaded clients, one of these functions is continuously running for every single one of our clients. So if we have 100 clients, we have 100 different functions of this running in the background at the same time. Okay. Awesome. So that's how that's working inside our threaded client now. Excuse me, I just had to take a break there. Inside of our threaded client, we now need to add some things. So the first thing we're going to add is ID count, we're going to global ID count because if someone leaves our game or disconnects, we're going to need to subtract from that. So we can keep track of accordingly, like how many people are connected, how many games are running and all that stuff. Okay. 
Now, the first thing we're going to do when someone connects to our, uh, what do you call it, our server, is we're going to send them what player they are. Remember what I was saying in this game class, or in this network class, sorry, that when we connect, we're initially just going to decode a string that's either going to be 0 or 1 to tell us what player we are. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to send con.send str dot encode p. Uh, and I believe this should be actually string p, like that. So that we know if we're player zero or if we're player one. That's the first step. Next, we're gonna say reply equals a blank string. We're gonna say while true. And this is where we're gonna start doing some more serious stuff in here. So the way that it's gonna work in terms of sending string data from our client to our server is we're gonna send one of three different options. We're gonna send get, we're gonna send reset, or we are going to send a move. And the move is gonna be like rock, paper, or scissors. So if we send get, what that means is we want to get the game from the server. So we're going to send that every frame. We're going to send get, that string get. And then the server is going to look and it's going to say, okay, what are you sending? You're sending get. All right, we'll send you back the game. That's how that's going to work. Another option is reset. Reset means reset the game. The game has finished. Both players played reset. And that's going to be sent from the client side because the client knows when we want to reset, right? The last one is a move. Same thing. When the client makes a move, so like rock, paper, scissors, if they are al allowed to make that move, which we'll check on the client side, we'll send that move to the server. The server will update the game accordingly, and then it will send back the game to the client. And that's how that's going to work. Sweet. So what we'll do now is we're going to say while true, we're going to say data equals con dot uh, receive, and then we're going to say 4096 in here instead of 2048, which we're using before, dot decode. The reason we're doing this is just in case um, we're sending too much information that is more than 2048 bits. We want to just double this number so that we can get more. If you run into any issues that say like pickle data was truanced or like ran out of input, just increase this number, okay? You can literally just do multiply by two in here, and that should hopefully fix the error. If it doesn't work, you can like multiply it by four, multiply it by eight, um, and that should hopefully fix your error for you. Okay, so now what we're going to say is we're going to say if game ID in games. Now, I'll talk about why we're doing this in a second. What we're going to say is we're going to say game equals games game ID. So essentially, every time we run this while loop, we're going to check if the game still exists. And that's what we're doing, right? So in this games dictionary, we're seeing if this game ID, which is the key to access the game, is still there. Now, why would we check that? Well, if one of our clients disconnects from the game, we're actually going to delete that game from the, uh, what do you call it, the games thing. Now, what that's doing for us, <clears throat> excuse me, is not only like keeping track of our memory, which means that we're not going to just continually keep creating games. So like say our server ran for weeks and we never deleted any games, then we'd probably run, run out of memory on our computer, right? If we're playing a lot of games, but it's also going to tell the other client that was connected to that game that, Hey, this game no longer exists. That means the other person must have disconnected from it. So we have to do something accordingly go back to the menu screen, right? Do something like that. Okay. So that's what we'll do there. And then what we're going to say in here is going to say, if not data, we're going to break this is similar to before. So I'll go through it a bit quicker. We're going to say else. And now we're going to check the three different things that could have been sent, right? So we've received the data. So we're going to check if we got reset, get, or if we got a move. So the first thing we'll check, we'll say if data equals equals reset. Okay. And then we're going to say, if data does not equal get, and then else, Sorry, this should be an elif. Elif data does not equal get. Else, we'll do something else. Uh, actually, do we need an else? No, we don't need an else. Okay. So if data equals reset, what we're going to do is we're going to say game dot reset, right? Because we already have the game. And if we look in here, what reset's doing is essentially it's resetting both players once so we can play another game. Really straightforward for that. Next one, if data equals get, what we're going to do is say game or if data does not equal get, sorry. So if it didn't equal re reset and it does not equal get, well then it must be a move. So it means we're either getting rock, paper, or scissors. So we're gonna send that move to the game to update it. So to do that, we're gonna say game.play and then we're gonna do the current player number, which is P and then the move. 
and the move is going to be whatever this data is, right? So it'd be data. Okay. And then otherwise, so I guess after that, um, what should we do here? We'll say reply equals game. And now what we're going to do is we're going to do con dot send all. And we're going to say pickle dot dumps uh, and not data, sorry, reply. Okay. And what this is going to do, let me just make sure I didn't run into any errors here is simply going to package up our game into that nice um, sendable form. We're going to send it over to our clients. Client's going to receive it, unpickle it, and then use it to uh, obviously make moves and do different things and draw it to the screen and all that. Okay. All right. So I think that makes sense. We can go through it really quickly. Uh, what time are we at? 25 minutes. All right. So we'll go through it really quickly. Essentially what's happening when you connect, we're going to check if we have an even amount of players or an odd amount of players. If it's an odd amount of players, when you connect, that means we need to create a new game. So we create a new game. If it's not, that means we need to assign you to a game. So what we're going to do is make the current game that only has one player in it ready. We're going to assign you to that and start a new thread. When we start the new thread, what's going to happen is we're going to send to the client what player they are, either player zero or player one. And then what we're going to do is we're going to constantly receive string data from the client. If the game still exists, then what we'll do is we'll check if they're sending us reset, get, or remove. If they're sending us a move, we'll make that move. If they're sending us reset, we'll apply that reset to the game. And then we're just gonna constantly send back to them the game object. And now what we need to do is just really quickly add some else statements in here so that if some of this stuff doesn't happen, we have like a catch for it, okay? So what we'll do here is we're just gonna simply say else break, okay? Uh, that should be lined up here. And we're just going to add a try and accept up here. So we're going to say try and we're going to indent all this by just highlighting and pressing tab. I'm going to say accept and then pass. I think that's yeah, no, not pass or accept and then break just in case, you know, something goes wrong with this data dot receive. We want to make sure the server keeps running. So we have that try and accept and then underneath this accept in line with the main function indentation. What we'll do is if we break out of this while loop, we need to close the game and delete it. So to do that is actually we're going to print uh, some on my wrong file here. We're going to print lost connection and then we're going to print uh, what do you call it? Closing game. Okay. And actually we can print that game ID too. If we want to see what game ID we're closing. So we'll say lost connection. Closing game, game ID, okay? And then we're gonna try to delete games, game ID. Otherwise, we will accept and pass, okay? And then underneath here, last thing we're gonna do is we're gonna say ID count minus equals one, and we're going to say connection dot close. Now that I actually think about it, we should probably put this closing game only in this try after we delete, just so that we don't, we only close the game once. We don't say we're closing the game twice. Okay. So what we're doing down here essentially is if we break out of this while loop. So for example, if the game no longer exists, uh, we're going to break. If something goes wrong with this getting data, so like the player disconnected, we're going to break. We're going to say lost connection. We're going to try to delete that game. The reason we have this try here is because if both players disconnect at the same time, one player will delete the game before the other. So if we try to delete a key that doesn't exist, we're going to run into an issue. So we try that. Um, if that works, we will say print closing game and then we'll say that game ID. Otherwise, we're going to pass. We're going to subtract from the ID count and we're going to close the connection. Sweet. So we're rolling. We're going pretty fast here. Now all we got to do is code the client. Now, this is probably the most amount of code. I think it's about 100 lines. It just is a lot of drawing stuff, okay? So I'm going to take a break. We'll be back in one second, and then we're going to code the client. All right, so I'm back now, and we've got about 150 lines to write for this file. It's pretty tedious because a lot of the stuff is to do with the drawing. Like, we need those buttons to be working. We need, um, like, all that text to be showing up. So that's, like, 90% or not 90%, but, like, 70% of the code we're about to write is just going to be cosmetic stuff. Um, but I mean, what do you want me to tell you? That's what we need to do if we're going to make an online graphical game, right? So, uh, let's start by just coding a class and this is going to be our button class. Uh, just so that when we have those three buttons, you know, it just makes things easier. So we're going to do our init. Uh, what do we need in the init? We're going to go for, uh, text. Sorry, I'm coding in the wrong file. Text X, Y, and color. 
and we're just going to say that the width and the height will be uniform in here and we'll just make it the same for all of our buttons so we're going to say self dot text equals text self dot x equals x uh self dot y equals y and self dot color equals color okay sweet we'll also add a width and a height in here so we'll say self dot width equals 150 self dot height equals 100 and feel free to play with these numbers this is just what i decided by the way guys uh, just really want to say this i'm not focusing on how good this game looks i know it looks like crap but you guys i know can go through and tweak the colors and tweak the positions and all that um i just don't want to focus on that because i want to get the hard stuff out of the way in the tutorial okay so let's do a draw method in here pretty straightforward we're just gonna do pi game dot draw dot rect and then for the rectangle we're going to take window which is that parameter for the draw and then we're going to do uh what should we do color so self dot self dot color and then we're going to need that rectangle position which is going to be self dot x self dot y self dot width and self dot height like that okay and then i guess let's see if there's anything else we need to add to that no that's fine we're going to define a font so we actually need to make sure we just add this at the top pygame.font.init okay make sure you guys add that and we're going to do font equals pygame dot font dot s s y s font should help if you spell font correctly and then in here you're going to pick your favorite font i like comic sans i'm going to make this how big should this be uh, let's make it 40 and then what we're going to do is we're going to render some fonts so we're going to say text equals font dot render and we're going to put self dot text we're going to do one and we're going to do the color which will be i guess in this case black or white 255 255 255 okay next we're going to draw this on the screen now we want this to be centered on the button so i'm going to do some like i don't know decently complicated math uh it's not really that crazy but we're going to just say window blit text and then we're going to say self dot x minus uh is it minus no it's plus self dot x plus in brackets and we're going to round in these brackets i know this is confusing we're going to do self dot width over two minus round and we're going to say text dot get underscore width over two now what this is doing essentially is we're starting at our x position but obviously we want our text to be centered so to center our text we need to know not only the width of the like container of the button but the width of our text so we're going to get the width of our text or of our button we're going to subtract that from the width of what do you call it our text so that way it should add like 20 or 30 pixels from the left side so our text is centered okay for the y we'll do a similar thing so inside make sure you don't mess up these brackets inside here we're just going to actually copy this um, and we're going to paste it right after a comma and we're simply going to say self dot y plus round self dot height okay plus text dot get underscore height or minus text dot get underscore height over two and that should center our button um yeah okay next we're going to say define click we're going to add a position here this is just going to tell us if we clicked on the button or not so it's a really basic uh if statement here so we're just going to say x1 equals pause zero and y1 equals pause one now what we're going to say is we're going to say if self dot x is less than or equal to x1 less than or equal to self dot x plus self dot width and self dot y is less than or equal to y1 less than or equal to self dot y plus self dot height i believe that's correct let me just check this uh yep that's correct then what we'll simply do is we'll return true indicating that we did press the button otherwise we will return false now i know i'm speeding through this but it's just because it's really basic pie game stuff and we're doing online games so let me make sure i change that so i don't want to focus too much on the cosmetics but essentially what this is doing is it's checking if the coordinate which we're going to pass in here which is going to be a tuple of x and y of our mouse position is actually in the button and the way we're doing that is we're saying well we go on the x right we check if it's greater than the x we check if it's less than the x plus the width so like if it's in between the little box and then for the y value we do the same thing but we're checking vertically to see if it's in that box if you don't understand that i have pi game tutorials where i go through like collision and how all that works um, i'm not really going to talk about that right now 
Okay, sweet. So we got that working. Now what we're going to do is actually, let's see what I want to code now. Um, let's code the main function and then we'll get into redraw window. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to define those three buttons that we're going to have at the bottom of our screen. So rock, paper, scissors, do that. We're going to say buttons equals, and we're just going to make three buttons. First button will be rock. So we're going to say rock. We're going to start it at 50, 500, and then we're just going to go and give it a color of zero 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 okay we're gonna create another button we'll say button and then we'll say scissors we'll give it a let me just check here 250 as an x 250 as an x 500 as a y and for the color for that i gotta check what color i made this i believe that i made that ah red okay so we'll go 255 zero zero and then one more button. Can anyone guess what this one is going to be? It's going to be paper. We're going to put this at a position of 450. So if I can go here, 450, 500, and we will simply make it blue or green. Sorry, 0, 255, 0. So red, green, blue. Okay, sweet. So that should be it for our buttons. Um, and now we'll get into the main function and start coding some stuff. The first thing we're going to need to do is we're going to need to say run is equal to false or is equal to true. I'll always do that. We're going to say clock equals pygame dot time dot clock uh, capital C here. My bad. Okay. Next, we're going to say n equals network right because we're importing network up here we're going to do a very similar thing to what we did before in all the previous tutorials where we just connect initially by doing that initialization and then we're going to say p equals actually player equals n dot get p right and you should already have that method um it's just returning that uh like connect what we connected to right so when we connect we get the player number which is either zero or one so we need that now it reminds me it's going to be a number, so we got to put an int around this so that we can compare it with other integers. Okay, and last we're going to just print just so we have this you are player player. Now this just indicates to us like when we initially run if we know we're zero or one just to make sure everything's working fine. Now we're going to make a while loop. We're going to say this is our main game loop. We're going to say while run and then in here we're going to do clock dot tick 60 very similar to what we've done before guys i'm gonna start adding some new stuff in a second okay so now that we've done this it's time to um start actually connecting and asking the server for information so what we should be doing here is every frame we should be asking the server to send us the game especially at the beginning of this loop because right now we haven't actually created a game class right we need to get that from the server so we're connected now we know what player we are so now what we can do is we can try to get that from the server. So to do that, we're going to say game equals n dot send get. And that's literally as easy as it is. We just need to do an accept and then we'll just, uh, what do you call it? We'll say run equals false and we'll say print couldn't get game. Okay. And the reason we're doing this and then we're going to break as well is because when we if we send this and we don't get a response from the server that means the game doesn't exist and what that, what if that happens well then what we should do is we should exit out of this game we should print saying we couldn't get the game and then we should try to reconnect or start a new game with someone else so this main function is going to be like the actual game running but once we exit out of this main function we're going to go to a main menu and the main menu will allow us to um choose like who we want to play against and a bunch of other stuff as well okay you guys will see that later okay so that's how we do that next what we're gonna do is we're gonna say if game dot both went now what we're gonna do here is if both players went well we're not waiting for anything now we need to see which one won so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna check which player won and we're gonna uh, display that message accordingly on the screen so what we're going to do initially is we're going to redraw the window. The reason we do this right away is because we want to make sure that if both players went, we're updating um, the window and on the window, it'll check like if both players have gone like in this redraw window and it'll draw the player moves for us. So you guys will see how that works in a second. We're going to do a delay and we pie game dot time dot delay 200. And now what we're going to do is we're going to try 
game, uh, sorry, game equals n dot send reset. Now, why we're doing this, obviously, is because well, if both players went, we need to tell the server to reset um, those player moves, right? So inside a game, if we call reset went, we're just going to reset it so that we were able to play the next round after. Okay, we're going to accept, uh, accept. Of course, I can't spell that. We're going to say run equals false. We're going to do the same thing as before. We're going to print couldn't get game. Couldn't get game. And then we're going to break. Okay. Now under this. So after we send that reset, now what we want to do is we want to display a message on the screen indicating whether player one won or player two won or like if you won or if the other player won. So the way we're going to do this, and it's actually a decent amount of lines is because we have to like render font and then we got to determine where we're going to draw the font and what's going to be on the font. So we're first just going to start by defining a font. So we'll say font equals pygame dot font dot SYS font. Okay. In here, we'll say comic sans font size. Let's go 90 for this one. Now we're going to say if game dot winner. And remember, if we go to game, winner is going to respond to us with either a zero a one or a negative one so it, you have to check if winner is one and player so whatever our current player is one then we're going to say you won if winner is one but the current player is zero we're going to say you lost right so that's how we can check this so to do that we're going to say if game dot winner equals equals one and player equals equals one and remember we got that player from the server so we know if we're either player zero or player one on the client side and uh, is it actually, is, do I need an and? Uh, oh, sorry, or that's what we need to do. Or game dot winner equals equals zero and player equals equals zero. So essentially what we're going to do here is we're going to check if this player won. So we know what player we are and we know what player won. So if that coincide, like what player we are and the player that won, then we'll print out and we'll say, or we'll put on the screen, you won, right? Telling that client they won. So we'll say text equals font dot render. And then in here we simply say uh, you one exclamation point, And then we can just do one and then a color. And obviously a color, we just do like red like that. Okay. On the screen. Okay. So else um, actually L if, and now we're going to check if they lost. Well, actually, I think we can, we can do this easier. We're going to say L if uh, game dot winner equals equals negative one. So if it if we tied, what we'll do here is we'll say text equals font dot render, and we'll just say tie game exclamation point one. Again, we'll put that in red. Okay, and now else. So if we didn't win and we didn't tie, we must have lost. So we can literally just copy this, and we'll just say you lost uh, as the text. Okay, so you lost. Dot dot dot. Sweet. And now what we're going to do is just render that font, put it on the screen. So, or not render it, just put it on the screen. So we'll say win.blit uh, text. And now we're going to do the exact same thing that we did before uh, to get it in the middle of the screen, just be a little bit easier. So we're just going to say, uh, I believe, do I need another brackets? No, I don't think so. We'll say width over two, and that's the width of the actual screen, minus text.get underscore uh, width. We need those brackets over two. We're going to do comma and now we'll just do the same thing with height. So we'll say height over two minus uh, text dot get underscore height over two. Okay. So that's going to put it in the middle of the screen. We're going to update the display high game dot display dot update and we're going to delay. So pygame game dot time dot delay and I'm going to put 2000 for two seconds. You guys can put whatever you want in here. Okay. So let's break this down really quickly. If both players went, that means now we get to check who won. So what we're going to do is we're going to redraw the window. We're going to, what do you call it? Uh, apply a small delay of 0.2 seconds, just so that we can see what both players did before it immediately pops up who won and who lost. So actually let's make this delay half a second. We're going to send to the server reset. So we're going to reset both players went so that the next time that we start playing, we can, both players are allowed to move. We're going to say run equals false. If this doesn't happen, if this doesn't work, we're going to print, couldn't get a game. We're going to break. Um, now, otherwise, so like if this worked, we sent the game, we're going to create a font. We're going to check who won. So either we won, we tied or we lost. 
I'm going to display that to the screen. We're going to delay for two seconds, and then we're going to play the game again after. Okay, awesome. So we're almost done. Uh, we're just going to add this uh, pretty actually complex for loop in here. So what we're going to do now is we're going to say for event in pygame.event.get. Very standard for pygame. You've probably seen this before. We're going to say if event.type equals equals pygame dot quit then what we're going to do is going to say run equals false and we're going to say pygame dot quit so this just means that they hit that little x button at the top of the corner now we're going to check if they actually press their mouse button down so this is how we're going to check if they pressed a button this is what we're going to do now let's say if event dot type equals equals pygame dot mouse button down then what we'll do is we'll get the mouse position to do that. We're going to say if we're going to say pygame dot pause uh, pygame dot mouse dot get underscore pause. So what we're doing here is we're checking if they press right, middle or left mouse button. If they do, let's get the mouse position. Now for every single button, we're going to check if we click that button. If we did, we're going to do something accordingly. OK, so what we're going to do now is going to say for button in BTNs. Remember, we define buttons up here. Then what we're going to say is if btn dot click pause. Now, if they did click the position, there's a few things we need to check. Oh, and also we need to check this. Sorry, and game dot connected. Sorry. So what this game dot connected is doing is just making sure that it's not going to let us press like rock paper scissors unless we both players are on. So that's just so that we don't run into an issue where we can make a move before the other player uh, connects. Okay, so just add this and game dot connected. What we'll do now is we're gonna check what our current player is, because this is gonna determine how we send a move. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna say if player equals equals zero, if not game dot, uh, what do you call it, P1 went, then we'll do something. Otherwise, so we'll just put uh, else here, and we'll check if not P2, game.p21 okay so what we're doing now and i haven't coded the rest of it yet is we're just going to check if we press one of the buttons so remember we have that click method in our button that tells us if we clicked on it so if we do click on it and we're connected to the game what we're going to do is we're going to check if our current player is zero or one now what we're doing is if we're player zero well we're going to check if player zero has gone yet if they've gone obviously we're not going to let them make a move right because they've already made that move they can't change their move once they made it same thing with player two so if we're not player zero we're player one clearly so that means we're going to check if player two has gone yet and if they haven't gone we'll allow them to move okay so what we'll do in here now is we're going to make a move now to make a move remember we just need to send to the network our move so we're just going to say n.send or to the server sorry and all we're going to do is we're just going to send the text of the button now the text of the button will be rock paper or scissors right and that's precisely the move that we're going to make depending on what button we're clicking so it's a really nice dynamic way to do that now um, once we've done that right so if we go to server what happens here is if we send that we're going to play that move and we're going to update it on the game so that the other client when it gets that game board again will have that updated move you guys will see how this works in a second okay so that's working well now all we need to do is just add in line with this right here we're going to say redraw window we're going to give it win we're going to give it uh what else do i need to give it game and p which stands for our current player and that's actually it for and make sure you just call our calling main down here at the end of client that's actually it for this main function so now all we need to do is do redraw window and we're really close to done so we got another like 20 lines uh and then once we do that we're actually finished this game and then we can start testing it out and talking about some more things we can add to it okay so what we're gonna do now is oh yeah it's actually quite a bit of work is we're gonna draw all the stuff on the screen now so we've done all the logic aspect of it down here in this main function. But now we need to draw everything. So it's more tedious than it is difficult. But we're just going to first start by checking if not game.connected. Now this just means if we have not yet had the other player connect, then all we're going to do is we're just going to print on the screen waiting for player and we're not going to show anything else. So to do that, we're going to say font equals pygame dot font dot sys font. Name obviously is Comic Sans. And then the 
how big should it be? Let's make it 80. Okay, and then we're gonna say text equals font dot render. In here, we're gonna say waiting for player dot 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 one color. Let's do nice red. And let's actually add true here for bold, okay? Okay, so we're gonna blit this on the screen. Um, so to do this, we'll say win dot blit. And we're gonna do again that same, I know, tedious thing to get it in the middle of the screen. So we're just gonna say width over two minus text dot get underscore width. And then we're gonna say height over two minus text dot get underscore height. Uh, and actually we need to make sure we're dividing both the width and the height by two. So let's do that. Okay. That's it for that. Now else. So this means if we actually are connected, both players are in. Now it's time to start drawing the real stuff on the screen. So we need to draw that. What was it? So actually let me pop up client for you guys. So you can see what it looks like. Uh, let's run server, rotten client, client. Right. So if we want to see the client, what we should do is we need to draw this 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 and then the three buttons okay so we're gonna have to do these four texts and the thing is these texts need to change um on like they're gonna be different depending on what player is looking at it right so for example here it's showing us what our move is but notice it just says locked in for opponents it doesn't tell us what our move is and what the other players move is right so we need to do that as well okay so to do that uh let's start um we're gonna make another font i'm gonna say font equals pi game dot font dot sys font comic sans size of this font let's make it 60 and then what we're going to do is going to say text equals font dot render and we're going to do your move so we're going to start by just doing your move and like opponent move because those aren't going to change they're going to stay the same no matter what and for that we're going to do one and the color i had there was like a nice cyan i think right so we'll do this um feel free to change the color i know it probably doesn't look the best and let's just put this at a static position on the screen so we'll say text and let's go 80 200 okay all right next so actually still in this else statement we're going to copy this um just sorry what am i doing just this text and this win part and we're going to put it down here and say your move we're going to say opponent move is that how you spell that? Uh, let's change that to opponents. And actually, let's just get rid of moves. It's going to be too big. Opponents and same color, except we're just going to change the X value so that we draw it at, uh, what do you call it? 380, like that, okay? So that's it for your move and opponents. Next, what we need to do is a bit more complicated because now we have to draw what the actual moves are. So remember, we're obviously, we don't want to show the other player what, one of the players moves is unless both of them have gone it's like we want to know what our move is but we can't know what the other players move is until we've both made a move so to do this what we're going to do we're going to start by just getting both player moves so we're going to say game dot get underscore player underscore move we're going to get move zero and we'll actually we'll copy this and just do move two and change this to one so we'll start by getting the moves and then now we're going to check if we should show those moves, if we should show waiting, or if we should show locked in. Okay, so to do this, we're going to say if game dot both went. Okay, uh, like that. What we're going to say is we're going to say text one equals font dot render. And we're just going to use the same font as before. And what it's going to be is move one, comma, one, comma, and we'll make this black. So zero, zero, zero. Okay, and we'll copy this. And we'll do the same thing except text two is going to be equal to move two. So essentially, this is saying if both of the players have gone, well, we can show their moves because they both made them. So let's do that. And it's just rendering that font. And we'll display the font after. Uh, you'll see how that works. So now, otherwise, if both players have not gone, what we need to do is we need to actually, let me just check something for a second, is we need to determine if we're going to show locked in, meaning the other player actually has gone, but we're not going to show their move, or if we're going to show waiting, which means the other player hasn't gone. So to do this, we're going to say if game dot P one went and P equals equals zero. So this is saying if uh, we have gone and it's our current, uh, like we are the player, we're player one. So if player one's gone and we are player one, what we're going to do is we're going to say text one equals font dot render move one, which is the move we've done, which is fine if we see that. 
and then we're going to say one and color zero 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 okay elif game dot p2 went and uh is this what it is actually sorry game dot p1 went you, you guys will see how this works in a second what we're going to say we're going to say text 2 equals the same thing now this might be confusing but essentially what this is doing is it's saying if player one is gone and we are player one we're going to say uh if i spell render correctly render like that render sorry i got interrupted there okay so if player one is gone and we are player one then we want to show underneath like your move what our move is otherwise what we want to show is we want to show that uh like locked in so we're going to change this to locked in underneath opponent's move because it means player one went but it's not us so it's not our move so that means we want to show it under opponent's move so you'll see how this works we're going to say locked in like that okay all right now we're just going to do uh, else so this actually just stands for if uh, game.p1 hasn't like if they haven't moved yet we're gonna just gonna say text 2 equals uh, waiting so we'll say waiting dot 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 I believe that's correct um actually sorry these all need to be text one my bad okay all right I know this is confusing but we'll go through it after all right so we're gonna actually copy this and we're just going to change everything to two. So this is going to be P2. This is going to be one. This is going to be two. It's going to be two. And it's going to be two. And this is going to be two as well. And let me just make sure that I did that correctly. I believe I did. Okay, sweet. And now we are going to actually show these. We're going to blit these on the screen. And we're actually really close to finish, guys. So to do this, we're going to say if P equals equals one. So if we're player one, what we'll do is say wind up blit. And we'll say text two, and then where we're we gonna show it, we're gonna show it at 100 and 350. Okay, now we'll copy this, so control D, and we'll blit one, except instead of at 100, we're gonna change this to 400. Now we're just gonna put an else. So if we're not player one, clearly we must be uh, player zero. So we're just gonna reverse these player one, player two. Now the reason we're doing this is because this is gonna be. Uh, where like player one and player two's moves are shown on the screen. So we want it to make so that for each of our clients, rather than saying like player one, player two, and having one of the clients have their move on the right side and one of them have it on the left side, we want it to be the same for each client. You, you guys will see how this works when we actually run the thing. So let's actually just, uh, let's add in drawing the buttons. So to draw the buttons, we could, uh, we could draw them in this else statement actually that might be better. Yeah, let's do it inside of this this else Okay, so we're gonna say for btn in Buttons, we're just gonna say btn dot draw and give it a win And I think that's actually all we need to do and lastly, we're just gonna update the display so pi game dot display dot update now assuming I didn't make any critical errors This should actually be working so I know this has been a lot of code and a lot of writing, but I think I've kept it to just about an hour now, actually. Um, and that's actually a pretty decent time for creating a game like this. So you guys will see how this works out. Okay, so let's try running our server and see if we get any errors, first of all. Okay, server, waiting for a connection, server started. Good sign so far. Okay, clients, let's try running a client. So I'm gonna client, oh, name P is not defined. Win game P, ah, okay. So what we're gonna do for client, this is a really easy fix, just change this to player. And I might have to change. Oh yeah, up here when I do redraw game window as well, we gotta do win, um, game, and player. Okay, so fix that. All right, client run, waiting for player. All right, good sign. Let's run another one. And would you look at that? Okay, they both launch in now. So you saw that waiting for player showed up, but as soon as we are ready, now both of them are showing up. Okay, so this should be player one. This should be player zero or player. Uh, player one player two, right? Okay, so let's try this now rock ah, ran out of input self dot client I received 2048. Okay, so let's just have a quick look at why this might be uh, Ah, so I think I might have find found the issue. I'm actually I don't know if this is the issue exactly But we do need to fix this uh, where I do game dot reset inside of server here It actually needs to be reset went because uh, that's what I called it inside here reset went So we just gotta make sure we do that Okay guys, so really silly error here actually. Um, the issue was on the server side here, I'm calling play, right? Like game.play. 
And so actually I need to get rid of this. I was just printing out the exception so I can see what it was. Uh, but essentially play doesn't actually exist because I misspelt something on game. I misspelt it. I misspelt player. It should be play. So that was the issue I was running into. Um, it just I, it was very difficult to see because it was just accepting it and not like not printing anything out, just continuing to run the server. So I couldn't find it. Uh, but essentially, if we run the server and we run the two clients now, we should have everything working. I haven't actually tested it, so let's pray. Uh, if I go paper, sweet. So it goes paper here. We're not getting locked in over here, so that might be an issue. But let's see if we make something here. Then since you lost and you won. Okay, so we have a slight issue, but it's a pretty easy fix. Let's just go up to uh, client, just look through. We're just probably messing something up in the drawing code here. So, let, oh, that would make sense. Well, we're not actually end up drawing. Yeah, so this, if P equals equals one, this just needs to tap back one, um, one indentation level. And now we should have everything actually working fine. So let's try this now, client, client, and let's go rock. Okay, so that works, but it's not doing the locked in for some reason. So let's check this this locked in portion. I just close that server and make sure that this is actually working. Ah, so that needs to be P2 went. And oh, well, if this one should be working, that was what's confusing. Okay, so actually, so that one just need to be P2 went game dot P2 went. Um, let's try this server. And let's go client. And let's run it again. And go scissors locked in sweet. So that's actually working and the game is pretty well finished. All we gotta do is add a menu screen and then we're gonna be done. So now let's go scissors. This is a scissors, scissors. That's not correct. We gotta fix that as well. Okay. <laughs> I thought I had everything working guys. I really thought so. Ah, okay. So I actually, I do, I do know the issue. It was, it's pretty straightforward. So in main here, when we check the, uh, let's see here, the winners, where do we check winners? If it equals equals one equals equals negative one. Um, ah, okay. So game dot winner needs brackets. Of course it does. <laughs> so we need to add that. So obviously just some silly errors guys. So servers running right now. Let's run these clients. See if everything is indeed working as, as it's supposed to be now. Okay. So let's try this paper locked in scissors. You lost you won. Yay. Okay. Everything's working. Okay. Paper paper tie game. Sweet. Okay. So you guys can obviously mess around with the timing, but you can see how this is working. So the only last thing to do now is watch this. If I disconnect, it disconnects both of them. So what we're gonna wanna do now, if that happens, is instead of uh, just completely like exiting the game, we're gonna wanna bring them to a menu screen where they can just click to reconnect. And this is a really, this is actually really easy to do. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna define another function. I'm gonna call this menu underscore screen. Okay, and in here, all we're gonna do is have a really basic while loop that just checks if you click something, and all it's gonna do there is click the uh, run that main function. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say run equals true. We're gonna say while run, okay, and then in here we're gonna say for event in high game dot event dot get, and then obviously we're gonna check if they click exit. So if event dot type equals equals high game dot quit. Then we will do is just do pygame.quit run equals false. Otherwise, if they click any key, so we'll say if event.type equals equals pygame dot, and we'll just say uh, mouse button down. So we'll actually just get it, they'll click the mouse button. Then what we'll do is we'll simply say run equals false. And at the bottom of run equals false, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna call main. So all this is gonna do, and we'll call menu underscore screen here. So we'll say while true, um, comma, menu screen. Okay, and I'll go through this in a second. We're gonna say while true, menu screen, okay? So what we're gonna do is in menu screen, if they click something, we're gonna call the main function, which is simply going to, uh, what do you call it? Do all of this stuff in here. And then if they exit out of the main function, so if you say like run equals false, because they disconnected, it'll just rerun the menu screen, which means that they'll be prompted to reconnect to a new game. Awesome. What we'll do in here is we'll add a clock as well. So we'll say clock equals pi game dot time dot clock. Give it a tick. So clock dot tick 60. Uh, we'll do, we'll just draw something in here. We don't need to use 
the redraw window function. Uh, we'll just do font equals pygame dot font dot sys font. In here, we'll go comic sans. We'll go 60. And then we're just going to render some text. We'll say text equals font dot render. In here, we'll simply say click to connect or click to play exclamation point one some nice red text and we can just continually actually we can just window fill um so window fill and we'll just fill it with white zero 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 or what am i saying gray actually 128 128 and we should just where is win do i define it up here somewhere yes i do so that's sweet wins up there so what we could do is just fill the window run into this while loop Put some text on the screen. Um, we may actually have to fill this every frame. Let's get rid of one of those brackets I created. So let's fill this every frame actually. Okay, so we'll fill it. We will blit this font. So let's say win.blit text. And you know what, for right now, I don't want to deal, we'll just do it statically. We'll just do like 150. So it's not at the top of the screen. Actually, let's go 100, 200. Okay, we'll go pygame.display.update like that then if they click something what should happen is it should break this loop they should be brought to the main thing and yeah that should hopefully be working for us so let's try this client click to play okay a little a little sketchy on the click to play but let's see if we click to play okay waiting for player so this is what actually what i wanted so it says waiting for player we're going to wait for someone else to connect okay boom connected sweet so now we're ready so let's just run a game let's go rock scissors now let's just see what happens if we click x this one goes to the menu screen where it says click to play and it can be um what do you call it play against someone else right and that's exactly what we wanted we may also want to add like a back button to go back but i'll leave that to you guys so guys i'm going to leave the tutorial here um if you guys have any questions or run into any bugs or anything please let me know this is by no means like a full complete game there's still obviously a lot of things that could be added to this and i might continue this series later but i think for now that's probably enough i hope that you guys learned how to make an online game i find this stuff really freaking cool and really interesting how you can have like a ton of different clients connecting together and with that being said i'll see you guys in another video <laughs>